Sarah, a spectacularly well-groomed blonde girl, thought she was unlucky in her personal life. It's been two years since she graduated from high school, and the goal she set for herself is still not achieved. And there is not even a hint that it will happen in the near future. So reasoned the girl, sitting in the back of the restaurant after her work shift. She bet on her looks. Back in high school, when they were choosing a profession, Sarah had firmly decided to become a kept woman. She wouldn't work like her parents, working most of the week for pennies. She would go to restaurants, have fun in clubs, relax, riding on yachts and lounging in the sun by the sea. The pitfalls of such a lifestyle did not scare her. Could she then imagine how unusual the demands of the rich could be? The clouds lifted over Sarah's head after she passed her final exams. Sarah scored so low that any admission to university was out of the question. Then her parents said that from now on they would not pay for the lifestyle she was striving for. Let her live and eat, but for pocket money she would earn it herself. At that moment Sarah realized that from now on these people are strangers to her. Because the people closest to her are always ready to support and help. And how tell me, sh she will look for wealthy suitors, dressed in cheap rags from the market. The carefree life was over. Finding a job turned out to be a challenge. No experience, no knowledge. All dirty and low paid, like a cleaner or kitchen assistant, the girl rejected immediately. Appearance, on which she had counted so much, turned out to be out of order. There were, of course, places where she would be accepted with pleasure, but Sarah didn't want to go there. She was determined not to get involved in promiscuous relationships. Yes, it would give her experience, but it would also give her a bad reputation, which she would not be able to wash off. No intimacy, she said, once again trying to get a job as a waitress, and she'd be shown the door. The girl was angry, disappointed, but she didn't give up. Day after day, she pounded the thresholds of establishments and firms in search of work, until finally she came across Quiet Harbor. It was a small restaurant on the outskirts of the city. The girl voiced the main requirement and in return received others. To be always beautiful, but without vulgarity. Charms do not sparkle and on the acquaintances do not ask for. Under such conditions to the rich clients will not be pimped out, but now the money was more important, Sarah agreed. To some extent, the girl even liked the job. Nothing that here the salary is not very large and she, as a person, no one notices. But the tips allowed not to count every penny and even leave the amount to her parents for food. Only they didn't take it, and the money was saved in a glass jar on the dresser. Soon Sarah allowed herself to visit a luxury boutique and imagine herself a millionaire's wife. Stepping on the throat of the toad strangling her, she bought a dress. Just one dress, but what a dress! She would be ashamed to wear it to a place where the golden youth of the city hung out. Sarah continued to chase her dream. However, time passed, and the necessary acquaintances were not. That's how the two years went by. Sarah stood in front of the mirror in the locker room and looked longingly at the white wisps of hair on her head. It was discolored, she called it. Now she would have to wait for her hair to grow back and then cut it off. As long as they don't fall out early. Girls do not go to the hairdressers, she warned her colleagues. And your hair color is so beautiful, said Mariana. Don't you want to be a brunette? Aha, supported her cashier Nelly. The owner jokes. I keep trying to hire brunettes, and they turn into blondes again. The air here is like that. Friends laughed. Soon the native chestnut-colored hair of the industry and allowed to make a normal, albeit short haircut, removing the terrible spoiled strands. In addition, Sarah gave her head a course of revitalization, and now her hair shimmered with silky shine. Having fixed the style, the girl moved on to makeup. She carefully prepared for each working day, or rather for the night, and constantly experimented with styles. During this shift Sarah felt someone's gaze on her. The time had long since passed midnight and the main stream of people had left. The hall was almost empty. Young lady, may I invite you in? Sit with me, Sarah heard a pleasant male voice. She came closer. At the table was a man in his thirties, very pleasant looking with a short haircut, typical of businessmen. He was also dressed businesslike, a light blue shirt, a tie, and a massive watch on his arm, obviously not expensive, as far as Sarah knew. Sit with me, he repeated politely. I'm sorry, I can't. It's against house rules, Sarah replied kindly. Please, just for a short while, to brighten my loneliness. Sarah twisted her head around looking for security. Fortunately, Billy had already turned his attention to them. Shall I call him the senior manager? He asked the visitor respectfully. 
The man stood up and whispered something in Talik's ear. He whispered to Sarah. Respect the man, sit with him for a while, with the owner I'll explain myself. What does he want? Sarah also asked quietly. Just to sit and talk. Sarah looked at both men in bewilderment. She sat down next to them. I haven't seen you before, do you work here recently? Asked the man. Sarah wanted to snort. Of course you haven't. I used to be blonde and put my makeup on differently. But instead she answered discreetly. Not that long ago. And I don't come here very often. The interlocutor replied. Tell me, what time of year do you prefer? A proper winter or a pleasant summer? Sarah was silent, not knowing what to say. At a party, among her peers, she would have found something to say. But here she had a client sitting in front of her, and she had a protocol for behavior, and it didn't include situations like this. Barry, the young man introduced himself without waiting for a response. My name is Barry. For people who know me well, just Barry. Tell me where you and I can meet in a calmer atmosphere, so you don't look at me like a frightened doe at a tiger. Is it really that obvious? Sarah asked. Barry smiled. Are you afraid of something? Of course I am. Getting to know the customers here means getting fired, and it's very hard for a girl of my looks to find a good job without getting into trouble. In other words, I don't want to lose this job because of you. I'm sorry. It was rude, but Barry just laughed. Sarah sat on the bed and thought about it. She had imagined such a meeting a thousand times, dreamed of it, longed for it. And now, when finally, fate touched her with its happy way, the girl was at a loss. And the best way to put her thoughts in order and calm down is physical activity. Sarah put on jeans, a t-shirt and a hoodie with a zipper, threw a sports uniform in her backpack and headed to her favorite fitness center. Indian summer was enjoying the warm weather. A light breeze tried to tear off the leaves of birch trees gilded by the bright sun, but they were still firmly held on their branches. The grass, as if revived, was a joy to the eye with lush green. There was not a cloud in the deep blue sky. In a good mood, Sarah walked through the glass door and was stunned. Standing at the entrance, chatting with the girl at the front desk, was Barry. A dark gray t-shirt attractively fitted his trained body, revealing to the eye the pumped muscles of his arms. The man reacted to the sound of wind music strapped to the top of the door. Hi, I mean hello. Barry's voice sounded both surprised and pleased. How did you get here? I came to stretch my muscles, Star replied, and mentally rejoiced that even for such a simple event, she had gone carefully groomed. The man approached almost closely. The barely perceptible aroma of expensive perfume was stupefying and confusing. Sarah, you are an amazing girl. She was invited to a restaurant and instead of picking out an outfit in the morning, she went to work out, Barry said, barely containing his laughter. I thought I'd buy something, thought Sarah, but I'm told it's for one day. And out loud, she parried. I could say the same thing about you. Let's just say I'm here for business reasons, Barry justified himself and turned to the reception. This girl's on me. Sarah was spinning in front of the mirror, scrutinizing herself before the meeting. She suddenly remembered her graduation outfit, which was a delicate lilac color. It was a satin fabric that covered the savory parts of her body, and the second layer on top was a decent dress made of transparent chiffon. The floor-length skirt fell in soft waves. Every step or breeze of the wind revealed slender legs. Again in front of the mirror spinning around, at your party gather, rumble mom, when will you stop running around and take your mind? Your classmates are already in their second year, and you have only men in your head. Sarah turned around. I work, provide for myself, and even bring you money. Everything is just the way you wanted it. Please stay out of my personal life with my father. Adel Ways was one of the best restaurants in town. Its outdoor terrace overlooked the waterfront and offered a beautiful view of the pond with its landscaped shoreline. The entrance was equally solemn, with antique statues, colorful flower beds, and towering fir trees. Sarah got out of the cab and shivered. The evening chill had already descended on the city, and a chiffon dress was clearly inappropriate. Trying to imagine herself as a queen, Sarah walked lightly to the door. The doorman politely asked her last name and escorted her to a table. Barry was already waiting. You look amazing, he greeted her, standing up to meet her. He took her by the hand, sat her down and moved her chair, then resumed his seat. A vase of fruit, a pitcher of juice, and two glasses stood on the white tablecloth on top of soft green napkins. Barry held out the menu. Order. 
It's up to you, Sarah replied. Feel free to order whatever you want. You know, Barry, Sarah was using the you again, to be honest. It's the first time I've been in a place like this and I'm a little lost. Maybe you could order something for me. Barry shrugged his shoulders and began to clarify the girl's tastes. Then he called the waiter and placed the order. They talked about everything and nothing, weather, books, movies, but they carefully avoided the topic of each other's personal lives. Sarah didn't want to talk about herself and her failed life, about her poor parents, and in return she wouldn't ask Barry the same thing. Come on, let's dance, the man suggested when the plates and bottle of wine brought by the waiter were empty. He stood up first, gallantly extended his hand to the girl and led her to the dancing part of the hall. They touched each other cautiously, keeping a respectful distance, but gradually Barry began to come closer, and now he almost pressed the girl against him. Sarah heard his excited breathing and realized that the dance had gone too far. She gently pulled away. Barry, I think that's enough. Let's go back to the table. What's wrong? The man took Sarah's hand and didn't let her go anywhere. The girl wondered how to explain to this man that the continuation he was hoping for was not going to happen. She used to blow off her peers with graceful, sometimes boorish, expressions, but she was afraid to use such a method with Barry. Still, if he continued to pester her, she would have to be more forceful. They stood in the middle of the dance hall, with couples circling around them. How silly, thought Sarah. Barry, I'm sorry, I should probably go. I shouldn't have agreed to this date, she said disappointedly. Why? The man was puzzled. You're too pushy. I'm not like that. I'm not like that. The man led Sarah to a table, sat her down, sat next to her. Did you really think that after the restaurant I would take you to bed? He asked me directly. You think so highly of me. Sarah was embarrassed by this frankness. Barry ordered dessert, but they ate it in silence. They hadn't spoken since the incident. Sarah mentally went over all the tricks she had used to seduce him, but with some sixth sense she realized that it was better not to experiment with Barry. They went out onto the terrace, but Sarah was not interested in beauty. Barry threw his jacket over her and put his arm around her shoulders. You'll freeze, the girl said. Not next to you, he replied quietly. The drunken wine was clouding the mind. Sarah wanted to cuddle up to that muscular body and warm herself in his arms. It was a miracle to keep from doing anything rash, and she realized it was time to end this date. Barry didn't object. He called a car and walked the girl to the exit. They exchanged phone numbers. Lastly, the man placed several large bills in the girl's hand. For a cab, he winked with a smile, ushering her into a car he owned with a private chauffeur. Surprisingly, he called again and then again, and again. Barry's courtship had been very romantic, but as a sponsor he was revealing himself gradually. Gifts became more expensive and the amount left for Sarah after a date became larger. She was always met at work by a car with a private chauffeur, flowers, and chocolates. One day he invited her to a big social event. Before that he introduced her to a woman who began to teach Sarah the rules of social behavior. He took her to a boutique for the chosen few, where it's impossible to get in without dating. Sarah didn't even know there was such a place. Trying on outfits reminded her of a scene from the movie Pretty Woman, a dream come true. Sarah considered the going out as a kind of exam and tried hard not to let Barry down. She got a tremendous pleasure from this event. It is necessary to communicate with the cream of society. She waited anxiously to see if Barry would invite her again. If he did, her exam was a success, and he did. Now Sarah was worried that Barry drove her home each time without asking her to spend the night together. Had she been too rude to blow him off at the restaurant, but she was also afraid to offer herself first. Time flew quickly and the first snow covered the ground. Do you want to go somewhere warm? Barry asked. Anywhere in the world. I have a week's free time. They went to the sea. Sarah was nervous. She knew how this trip would end. He wouldn't take her home tonight. They rode on a yacht went on excursions, and their table in the restaurant every day was filled with exotics and delicacies. The girl let Barry pull her closer and closer to him. Finally, he carried her to his bedroom. But in the midst of his caresses, Sarah suddenly became frightened. She shrank back against the headboard. What's wrong? Barry asked worriedly. You see, I don't know how to do anything. You're the first man I've ever been with. Barry froze, the amazement on his face changing to delight. He pressed the girl gently against him. Don't worry, he whispered affectionately, we'll make it work. My girl, my Sarah. They hadn't talked about their personal lives like this in a long time. 
Barry seemed to avoid the subject as much as the girl herself. And now he was taking her to meet the family. They drove out of the city and soon turned into a new, still under construction cottage village. Only very wealthy people could afford to buy a house here. This whole area, Barry said, as if getting a tour, was built and is still being built exclusively by our firm. There's a lot of work to be done. The village is growing. Soon it will reach the city. There are already stores, calves and even a private kindergarten and clinic. In general, a dozen more years, and here will be quite cozy. And I started with my own house. Sarah looked around. Trees grew along the roadway. The yellow line of the bike path shone through the snow on the wide sidewalk. Cozy houses were hidden behind the fences. All in all, the village looked well-maintained and tidy. Barry pressed a button on some remote control, and they drove through the open gate without stopping. The two-story house with a garage didn't look very large or even modest. It was surrounded by trees and a lawn covered with snow. In the distance stood a large gaze bowl with a barbecue, a stove, and an area for rest. A child's sleeping stroller with a miniature robot sitting on it stood out as a red blur on the cleared sidewalk. Barry walked over to the stroller first, peered in and smiled warmly. Sleeping, little one, he whispered. This is my daughter Victoria. She just turned a year old. What a surprise. The presence of a child with her chosen one shocked the girl. Are you married? She asked in a demanding tone. No, for the first time Barry didn't shy away from answering. Let's go inside. How stylish it was. Clearly a designer's work. Sarah walked through the interior of the house, mouth open in delight. The hallway flowed seamlessly into the living room. Both were done in yellow and brown colors, the chandelier shone with crystal. One large floor-to-ceiling window, covered by a white, airy curtain, stood out from the ordinary windows. By its side stood a massive dark table with carved legs and upholstered chairs in yellow tones. That's the dining area, Barry explained, over there, the kitchen, mostly for cooking. In the kitchen, a woman in her forties was working at a long table in the center. Next to her lay a clipboard, which she glanced at from time to time. Hello, Selena, Barry greeted her. She answered him with a nod of her head. I'd like you to meet Sarah. Selima is my Victoria's nanny. She's been with her almost since she was born. And this here, he held up the clipboard, is the video nanny. Have you seen the robot on the stroller? That's a camera. The picture and sound are transmitted here. Let's move on. The fireplace, Sarah marveled. Is it real? Yes, but I rarely light it. I've forgotten the last time. The delighted girl went to the fireplace. On the shelf above the hearth were a few knick-knacks and a photograph in a simple wooden frame. Sarah involuntarily fixed her gaze on it. There Barry was cradling some girl in his arms. They were smiling happily. It seemed to Sarah that the girl looked just like her. The same cut of dark hair, the same cut of light brown eyes and the same slightly elongated face. And even the features of this face seemed to look like Sarah's. Who's that? Sarah asked. My wife, Barry answered. You said you weren't married. Not now, he walked over and put the picture down. It's my past, and it's none of your business. Come on, I'll show you the house next. Wait, Sarah suddenly became indignant. So you're with me because I look like your wife. Barry was silent, and that turned the girl even more. I thought you were interested in me, but I'm just a copy for you. She turned around proudly and walked towards the exit. Sarah, wait. Yes, you do look like her, Barry admitted. If you don't like it, you can leave right now and we'll never meet again. But I like you too. You're amazing, you're gentle, you're pure. And so fragile. Sarah stopped. She didn't want to lose her rich lover, but it seemed humiliating to be around him as a substitute. Can you give me time to think? She asked. Come on, I'll show you the rest of the house. There's an office here, a nursery, a bath with all the amenities, a staff room over there. Upstairs are bedrooms, dressing rooms. Let's go downstairs. The stairway to the basement was hidden in a nook. You never know it was there. Barry went down quickly, flicking a light switch. Sarah followed in reluctantly, and she gasped. Half of the space was taken up by the pool, or rather the place for it. Spot lamps shone from above like stars with a bluish light. A short wall was occupied by an image of open space, the competent illumination creating a sense of reality. Barry walked over to the wall and pressed some kind of button. The view changed to a rainforest and the light from the overhead lamps turned yellow. The next picture was of the sea. 
There are a couple more paintings here, Barry said casually and here, he walked along the long wall, opening the doors on his sauna, locker room, another one, it's empty. I haven't been down here in a long time, there's a lot of unfinished work and dust. If you become the owner of this house, you can organize it as you like. There's also the roof, which is a mess, even though it was supposed to be a winter garden, but you can do what you want. Do you want me to live here? Sarah asked. Listen carefully. I want a wife and my daughter a mother. I propose to you to make an agreement. I create a secure life for you, and you fulfill the specified duties, plus some other little things. I don't get it. What do you want from me? I want a wife, Barry repeated patiently, to fulfill my marital duty and to accompany me wherever a companion is required by status. I'll teach you how to behave, what to say. Other than that, you don't change your appearance or try to find out my past. And most importantly, you will be a good mother to Victoria. I'm afraid I won't be a good mother. I've never dealt with children, Sarah said irritably. You'll have time to adjust and learn. Selena will help. I want Victoria to be surrounded by a mother's warmth and care, to see you as a role model. If you have the desire and love for the girl, the rest will work out. I understand you need to think about it. Will a week be enough? If you don't let me know within that time, I'll understand. Did you have that wife living with conditions too? Sarah asked unhappily. Just said you stay out of my past. I'll think about it, said the girl proudly. But if anything, you will remove the picture from the fireplace. Three beautiful girls were sitting in a cozy cafe. Sarah had gathered them. She had met Barry and his lawyer before, and they had discussed at length the details of the contract she would have to sign before the marriage. Barry seemed to have thought out every situation and put every little detail in there. Sarah, for her part, had also made some conditions and privileges. These are his requirements, Sarah summarized her story, and frankly, I'm a little scared to agree. But think about looks that Mariana, sipping her cocktail through a straw without hurry. If a millionaire told me that he likes only bald girls, I would shake my head twice a day, I really would. Yes, and with the child, he does not make you a babysitter and snot white does not force, supported her friend Nelly, snacking on champagne salad, well, hug her, kiss her cheek, read a book there, but what a man you get. By the way, does he promise much in the divorce? Only what will belong to me, you know, clothes, jewelry, and what will be written on me. And not a penny of money. None at all. Or as he sees fit. Will you tell me what to do? Sarah begged. Agree or fuck him and look for someone else. Do you have someone else in mind? Nellie asked politely. Sarah sighed heavily. Barry had already partially introduced her to his social circle. But it was unlikely she'd be able to approach them. I don't know, expressed her opinion, Marjane, I'd agree. Do you think others will have better demands? And someone also needs to give birth to an heir. By the way, he doesn't demand you to give birth. No, he doesn't even allow accidental pregnancies, only with his permission and consent. That's good, or you'll lose all your beauty with a belly. The friends talked for a long time, reminiscing about the past, wondering about the future and washed the bones of acquaintances and strangers. By the end of the meeting Sarah, who was quite tipsy, made a final decision. Sarah, a spectacular brunette of 22 years old, left the expensive boutique in an elite shopping center in a rage. She had to embarrass herself so badly. Tapping the heels of the latest model boots on the mirror floor, the girl hurried to the exit. Her head was full of curses. Ashole, bastard, he promised. He promised. Wait till she gets him a hard time. Sitting down on the seat of her silver Volkswagen, Sarah thought. Anger was still bubbling in her soul, but her emotions were gradually cooling down. The problem wanted to be solved urgently right here and now. Sarah took out her phone from her leather purse. I'm busy right now, the answering machine said in a monotone voice. Leave a message after the beep. I'll call you back. Sarah tossed the useless gadget on the passenger seat, started the car, and drove home. She spent the rest of the day nervously pacing the room. Everything irritated her. The huge mirror above the fireplace, the floral arrangement on the far wall, the soft cushions of the sofa with their yellowish hue, and the fluffy carpet on the floor. From the kitchen came the pungent smells and clinking of dishes, and tonight Mickey, a heavy scent man in his fifties, was the cook. That meant the restaurant was canceled tonight, and dinner would be at home. Three-year-old Victoria came in from her walk and rushed to her mother right from the doorstep, but stopped halfway. 
She turned around and wandered dejectedly back into the hallway of Andres. Selena gave Sarah a scornful look and left to attend to the baby. Sarah tried to call her husband again and again, but heard only an indifferent answering machine. She contacted the bank, but they didn't say anything clear. She tried to cry to her rich friends, but they were busy and only invited her for a cup of coffee in the evening. Where are you, Nelly and Mariana? Sarah suppressed a feeling of nostalgia. She herself had cut them out of her life for lack of common interests. Having tried all the options in an attempt to calm down and not getting what she wanted, the girl dialed the cherished number. Hello, my favorite, without you been trying to hide her mood, said Sarah. Hi, sweetie, cheerfully answered the phone in a man's voice. How are you? You sound sad today. You have no idea how angry I am today, Sarah frankly confessed. Not shy in expressions and giving free rein to her emotions, she colorfully described both the problem and her opinion of her husband. Well, he is a jerk, supported the girl interlocutor, and the others are not better. Come to me, my darling, I will calm you down. Sarah smiled at least someone really loves her, someone needs her. She took a household paper bag, slipped a couple of bottles of Conan from the bar into it, and headed for the kitchen. Mickey winked cheerfully. Would you like some lunch? He asked. I've got the first course and a salad ready. I'll have the rest for dinner. That's a shame. I couldn't drag food out of the fridge in front of him. Without answering, Sarah walked away. She went up to the dressing room and threw off her jeans and t-shirt. She put on a short, tight dress, fixed her hair and makeup. In the light of the street lamps, the first snow was swirling, or the second. To hell with it, even the tenth, as long as this slush was over. Like her tights, contrary to the advertisements did not keep me warm at all. Shivering and adjusting her cap, Sarah grabbed her purse and a bag of bottles and left the yard. She didn't want to take her car because she didn't want to drive back drunk and she was afraid to call a cab to the house. It was a couple blocks walk to the bus stop. Sarah looked longingly at her trademark sweet boots and then at the puddles with the last autumn leaves floating in them, but immediately she paused to pucker up after all and now she was on her way to see her lover. They'd met about six months ago when Austin was fixing the wiring. A young boy about her age, handsome, dark-eyed, with a disheveled lock of stiff hair, he'd entertained Sarah with harmless jokes and stories throughout the job. If there had been anyone else around at that moment, the girl would have just laughed for good measure, and that would have been the end of it. But unfortunately or fortunately, she was home alone, and this circumstance allowed Sarah to relax and let go of her emotions. She laughed like a child and probably felt truly happy for the first time in a long time. She realized what it meant to love. When Austin finished work, Sarah, to keep him a little longer, invited him in for a cup of tea. Afterwards, she wrapped up some goodies from the fridge and gave him a few bills over and above what she had promised, writing her phone number on the top one. From now on, Austin was her secret, her ray of light in life, her happiness, her dream. Sarah only smiled when she remembered that boy his hands, his lips. Even in bed with her husband, Austin was the only thing on her mind from now on. She wanted to leave this house and this life and go somewhere far away with her beloved, to a warm land, to the sea, forever. To be alone together, not to be torn in two and not to share herself with anyone else. And to change her hair and keep messing around with her looks. But Austin stopped her every time. My joy, he said, you're a queen, you must shine and I can't give you a decent standard of living. As long as this purse provides you, take up more money, buy some jewelry, find over some property to yourself, at least a cottage by the sea. Save up. Now her savings were lying in a useless block bank account. How long would this situation last? Austin met her today, dressed in jeans and a black t-shirt with a red fox. Hello my joy, come in, I've been waiting, he took the package and pecked the girl on the cheek. Sarah looked around the small but cozy room. The couch wasn't new, but it was decent enough, folding out into a double bed. The desk was littered with papers and books, and the desk lamp was on, indicating that the owner of the room had just been working. A small rug on the floor and matching curtains made the room look cozy. Sarah had rented this place for Austin almost immediately after they'd met, dragging him out of his old, shabby, musty dorm room by the scruff of the neck. The kid was out of town. His hometown was about 400 kilometers away. Austin liked to talk about it. Here he was studying at some kind of advanced training course and at the same time managed to earn a part-time job. Soon his business trip would be over and Austin planned to go home. 
The girl went into the kitchen. The pleasant smells of baked chicken and oranges whetted her appetite. The table was already partially set, a large plate with salad, sliced bread and fruit. Lit candles and a bottle of red wine added to the romance. Sarah's heart was warmed by such care. She smiled. And I brought cognac. I like it drunk. If you knew, my favorite, how badly I feel now. Come, eat and tell me. Austin took the girl by the hand and led her to the table, as if to the altar. That's the way it is, Austin, Sarah said sadly, lying in her lover's arms on the unfolded couch. He's blocked all my cards and accounts, and I don't know what to think or do. This is what I did wrong, what? Austin, Austin, honey, I'm so tired of sneaking around. Sweetheart, I'll go away with you. You've got such good hands, you'll always get a job, a good job, and I'll get something too. We'll live a little less richly, but together and happily. I'd love to, my dear. But what if you can't stand it, and you can't go back, Austin said. I think you'll be all right. They lay in the dim nightlight for a long time. The clock of the wall ticked away, mercilessly counting down the time they had allotted to each other. Sarah didn't want to go home. She wanted to lie like this forever. She wanted Austin to stroke her hair and say comforting words. So tender, so attentive, so caring. It's going to be night soon, Sarah realized, and I have to go. Austin, honey, I wish I could stay with you forever. Come on, I'll walk you out, Austin replied and kissed the girl tenderly. Sarah got home well past midnight. Without undressing, in boots and coat, she went into the living room. Her husband was already at home. He was sitting on a nasty yellow sofa in the same clothes he had come from work in. Pants, light blue shirt, tie. His jacket was lying next to him. Where have you been? He asked Sarah tiredly, staring at the fireplace. What do you care? She snapped at him. Where can I be when you've blocked all my cards? Sarah was indignant, but no longer angry. Wine with brandy, a thick dinner and a tender embrace did its job better than any sedative. Barry took his eyes off the fireplace and stared at his wife. His eyes were filled with concern and surprise. And yours too? He asked worriedly. What do you mean, yours too? Sarah sat down on the couch beside him, unable to keep her feet up. Barry, explain to me what's going on. You promised. Remember what you promised. My clouded mind couldn't formulate a coherent thought. Are you drunk? Go to bed, I'll explain tomorrow morning. No, now Sarah was suddenly angry. She swung the purse she was still holding and hit Barry on the shoulder. He rose sharply and intercepted the girl's arm, preventing a second blow. Then he scooped up his wife and dragged her up the stairs and into the bedroom. There he threw her on the bed and then threw a pillow lying on the chair. Here, tear off all the evil on it and sleep it off. We'll talk tomorrow, he said grudgingly and left the bedroom. Sarah woke up with a wild headache and thirst. Yesterday's event seemed like a nightmare. Does my husband know that I have a lover? The girl thought in fear and jumped out of bed. She was still in the same smart dress and street boots, with her coat, hat, and bag lying on the floor. Feeling disgusted, Sarah changed into a row and walked out of the bedroom. Carefully, she descended the stairs and ignoring the bathroom, crossed the living room to the dining area. Her husband was eating breakfast. Good morning, he said calmly, as if nothing had happened yesterday. How are you feeling? Sarah sat down at the massive dining room table and wrapped her arms around her head. I think I overreacted yesterday, she said. I can see why, Barry grinned wryly. I called the bank today and found out everything. Anyway, the situation is this. We have a little problem at the firm. Well, small problems. They're solvable, but they take time. In the meantime, the bank has seized all our accounts. I never thought they'd do the same to you. But I guess they figured since you're my lawfully wedded wife, you and your husband should share the responsibility. I've asked him to unblock your card, but now you'll have a certain and not very large amount to spend. This is not my request, it is the bank's request. Please understand, a lot of things will have to be cut back now. What are you going to do now? The anger was building up, and Sarah started to raise her voice, you can't do anything at all, can you? What does this have to do with me? I have nothing to do with this firm of yours. When you married me, when you signed that prenup, you gave me guarantees. It's not even profitable to divorce you now. Did you want to? Barry reacted sharply. Sarah froze, feeling a chill run up her body. A prickling thirst with a bitter taste was in her mouth. Mickey, get some water. Sarah shouted in a commanding tone. Mickey's a cook, not a servant. 
Barry shouted, stood up and poured water from a jab on the table into a glass. Here, drink it, and don't think that if I don't say something I don't know about it. I told you, the difficulties are temporary, the accounts are frozen as a precaution, not because of bankruptcy, and eat something, maybe you'll start thinking. Barry slid a plate of vegetable garnish and finally chopped meat to the girl. As he walked away, he stopped and, without turning around, added, I thought you and I would discuss expenses together under the circumstances, but I see that I will have to decide everything myself. From now on, we'll eat at home, whatever Mickey makes. Selena won't be coming in as much as she used to. Maybe it's for the best. You've stopped doing things with your daughter, and it's in our contract, remember? Victoria's all grown up now. She doesn't need to be watched every second. Oh, and by the way, the resort trip is canceled. I've already put our yacht and beach house up for sale. Yesterday in her anger, she'd imagined and replayed in her head a hundred times what she'd say to her husband. How embarrassed she felt in the boutique when she tried to pay with a block card. How ashamed she'd apologized and left her new collection under the slanted glances of the salesroom. Now the fear that her small but intimate secret would be revealed was icy shards spinning somewhere inside, paralyzing her will and thoughts. Was Austin right, and was she really afraid of losing her well-fed, secure life? After breakfast, Sarah went up to the dressing room. There, on the bottom shelf of the closet, her jewelry was stored in a safe. She opened one jewelry box, then the second, and dumped its contents on the floor. Raked everything off the shelves. Earrings, rings, bracelets, necklaces, chains, what not. Gold and silver set with precious stones, including diamonds. How much could all this wealth be worth? Thought Sarah. How long can one live on all this? She went through the jewelry again and again. Then she picked up her phone and began searching for similar items on the internet. She was interested in the prices. Here, in a pleasant silence, on a warm parquet the girl spent several hours. She estimated, added up, calculated. The final sum inspired optimism and hope. Gathering the jewelry back and closing the safe, the girl went to one of the drawers with underwear. She opened it and stuck her hand to the far wall. There were $5,000 bills in thick wads. Sarah had realized from the beginning that she needed to have a financial safety cushion independent of her husband, and the only way she could provide it for herself was in the form of cash. For two years she had been saving up her savings, withdrawing from the amount she was given without her husband noticing. It was time to count the bills. In the morning there was a note on the empty dining room table. Take a walk with your daughter, I'll be home late, kisses. Your husband Barry. Sarah irritably squeezed the piece of paper into a ball and tossed it into the hamper. Missed. The girl sat down at the table and thought, I wonder what her husband is up to. Did he really have such serious problems at work, or was it just an excuse to limit her spending? Does he have the right to do that? I'll have to reread the prenup carefully, and did he really know something? Sarah was weighed down by the uncertainty, but going in first was guaranteed to be a burn. Delicious smells wafted from the kitchen, fueling an already demanding hunger. Three-year-old Victoria sat on a high stool at the long cutting table in the center. She was rolling some sausages out of the dough and laughing joyfully. Oh, mommy's here. The little girl exclaimed excitedly, unable to pronounce the words. She jumped up from her chair and hugged Sarah. She shuddered at the touch of the child's hands, soiled with dough and flour. She gently pulled the girl away from her. Hi, Mickey said cheerfully. Are you going to eat? Victoria and I are making pancakes. I'll, I'll feed mommy, Victoria declared. All right, Mickey said. Here, take a pancake. Put it here on the plate, then take the cottage cheese and put it on top of the pancake. Wrap it up like this. The cook went back to the stove and Victoria climbed back onto the high stool and began to do the show manipulations. Sarah watched the girl's hands and satisfied face, her clothes and hair getting dirty. Oh my goodness, she thought. Do I have to wash it all up later? The girl sat down on a chair nearby and immediately a small lump of cottage cheese flew into her face. Trying not to show her squeamishness, Sarah brushed it away with her hand and overcoming the urge to slap the little girl's hands, smiled strangely. She couldn't afford to do the wrong thing. Mickey, Salima and even the housekeeper who came in were tacit observers and reported to Barry everything that happened in the house in his absence. There wasn't even any need for cameras. But they never did that to Sarah. She was a stranger to them. I'm going to go wash up and clean myself up, and you go on wrapping the pancakes, Sarah said and left. The situation did not suit the girl at all. 
and she was going to live with no money and housework, it was better to live with her lover. Sitting down on the edge of the bathtub, Sarah took out her phone and dialed the number dear to her heart. Hello, my dear, the familiar voice warned her soul. I'm a little busy right now, but a couple of minutes for you will be found. Talk to me. I'll try to come to you tonight, Sarah said. There's a situation, so I'll tell you all about it later. The day wasn't working out. Sarah couldn't bring herself to eat the pancakes that had been rolled up by the children's hands. She went to the refrigerator and was amazed at how different the contents were. Previously there had been whole sticks of sausages and smoked meats, vacuum pack slices, several kinds of cheeses and jars of caviar, exotic fruits. Right now, almost all the space was taken up by vegetables and leftover cooked dishes from the evening in pots and pans. Sarah pulled out a piece of half-eaten sausage and made herself a sandwich, brewed some coffee and retired to the dining area. It was good to have Selena. Sarah had gone days or even weeks without seeing her so-called daughter, and she didn't miss her. Dealing with a three-year-old terrified her. How did she live these two years? How did she manage to show her husband care about the girl? In fact, with her not communicating. The first year of their life together, Barry did not demand anything from her, so, occasionally, all communication with Victoria took place exclusively in the presence of the nanny or her husband, and in case of what they could always back up. The second year I had to be more subtle. She refused to spend time together under the pretext of business or fatigue. Turns out being a kept woman is a lot of work. The obligatory visit to the spa once a week, to fix her hair and nails, to prepare herself for the next important meeting. Sarah deliberately stayed longer in the stores, ostensibly choosing a new dress and jewelry for the next outing, and to sit with friends or go to the club. She is also a human being and chagrest. In total, almost four months were spent at resorts and traveling. In addition, Sarah pleased her husband well, and he did not interfere with questions. Again, she carved out hours to talk to Victoria when Selena or Barry were around. The latter was her favorite. That was her way out. She hadn't even considered the option of loving the girl. She didn't even like her husband very much. And how the relationship would develop further, she didn't think about it. Mom, I'll eat with you. Victoria shouted and began to jump off the high chair. The chair shook and hit the floor with a terrible rumble. The little girl flew next, and there is no telling how she would have landed, but she was picked up in time by the strong arms of the cook. Sarah's heart froze for a split second, but then it started beating again as if nothing had happened. Mom, are we going out tonight? Aunt Selena and I go to the park every day to feed the birds, and I rode a little horse, and you're going to tell me a story. What a bore, thought Sarah, I wish I'd put her in daycare, so she wouldn't get in the way all day long. Daycare. Mickey, she shouted, why doesn't Victoria go to daycare? How come she doesn't? The man looked out of the kitchen, surprised. It's just that it's Sunday. Sunday, he and Barry would walk in the park or on the waterfront, making plans, discussing events. In the evening, they'd stop by Edelweiss, where their first awkward date had happened. They were sure to dance to the dancing candlelight and live music. They were served a dish burning with a bluish flame each time different. Also, Barry was sure to order her a song. It's so strange, Sarah thought. But once he was not my favorite, but still close to me. How suddenly everything had changed. Sarah, Mickey's come closer. The girl needs a walk in the morning. Then she'll go to bed. It's not my whim. Barry told me to tell you. Okay, I understand, hiding her irritation, Sarah replied. Tell me, does she get dressed on her own or does she need help? Come on, little squirrel, Mickey said. Mommy wants to take you for a walk. Show her how you can dress yourself. Victoria shouted and ran into the nursery. No, this is not a child, but a punishment. Sarah came back from her walk furious. Why had she put on those thick-soled shoes, so she wouldn't feel bad walking through puddles in them? They're old, bought three months ago. They would last until spring or rather, they would stay on the shelf, and then the new collection would be on sale and she could throw them away with peace of mind. But how heavy they turned out to be. Victoria wouldn't let her stand still for a second, and she was always trying to run away. Sarah didn't just have to walk, she had to run. She had to jump. And now her legs were falling off. And the jacket? It's made of some special fabric with silver threads, and now it's splattered with mud. Yes, it was old too, almost a year old, but it was her favorite. The girl's sorrowful musings were interrupted by a whimpering Victoria. Shut up, quietly hissed Sarah at her, 
It's sickening without you. But the little girl only sobbed louder in response. Sarah irritably, with sharp movements, began to tear off the girl's outer clothing, bad-mouthing Selena. When she got to her pants, they were damp through and through. There was water in her wellies. Her t-shirt and hair were damp, but not because of the puddles, but because the girl was sweating. Mickey, Sarah called out. She was at a complete loss. What to do next? She could use all the help she could get, all the advice she could get, even from the cook, but no one answered the call. Of course, he's in the kitchen, rattling dishes wherever he hears them. Sarah, struggling to move her legs, dragged herself to the kitchen. No one. It was just Sarah and Victoria and the whole house. She would have taken her anger out on the girl now, but Sarah was more than sure that the public rooms were bugged, probably the dressing room too, and even the bathroom. A cold sweat broke out at the thought. Sometimes she forgot her precautions and called her lover from home. But the girl quickly pulled herself together. What she had done could not be undone. She had to think about what to do next. She undressed the girl completely and took her to take a warm bath. Victoria whimpered and resisted. The hell with you, Sarah thought. Let's go, let's get her dry, eat and go to bed. She sat the girl down at the baby table and went to get some clean clothes. When she returned, she saw that Victoria had fallen asleep with her head resting on her arms folded on the table. Sarah sighed heavily, picked up the baby and carried her into the nursery. She turned on the video baby monitor on her tablet. Now she had some free time to rest and recover. Sarah plopped down on the yellow hotel couch and opened the messages sent to her. Her friends were making plans for tomorrow. Replying to nothing, Sarah disconnected her phone and wondered, should she tell them what had happened? Would they give good advice? Or, on the contrary, would they tell her husband about her doubts, and then Yurka would get to her in no time? No, I don't think so. Let them hear about it from other sources. Let them think that she endures all the hardships of life, confirming her love for her husband. Sarah. Mickey interrupted her musings. These damp clothes have to be taken from the hall to the washing machine. The maid won't be here until next Saturday. It's not like she's going to be here for a week. Sarah reluctantly scraped herself off the couch. On the one hand she was annoyed at the cook's command, on the other she needed someone to help her. Arguing with such a man would be costly, so she would diplomatically tolerate him for now. Then she would complain to her husband. Sarah looked at the pile of damp children's clothes lying in the hallway, picked up the pants with two fingers and carried them into the bathroom. On the way, the soiled panties fell out of them. Sarah almost threw up. Oh shit, it dawned on the girl, I didn't even put this little brat on the potty after the walk. Uh oh. She threw off her dirty clothes and rushed to the bathroom. Sarah ate lunch in the kitchen. She didn't have the energy to drag the plates to the dining room table. Picking at last night's salad with her fork, she wondered how she could sneak off to Austin's tonight. They put her on the back burner and she'd never get away. Mickey was tinkering around the stove and humming softly. He must have taken the dirty pants out of the living room too. Unless they'd made it to the washing machine by themselves. Mickey, overpowering herself, the girl turned to the cook, would you mind sitting with Victoria tonight? Just for a couple of hours? I'm going crazy with her, I need to get away from her. I want to go to a club, I'll pay you. Go have some fun, the man replied. I understand that it's hard to get used to it. Victoria woke up cranky. In vain Sarah tried to put her on the potty, dress her or take her to the kitchen. The baby responded to any touch with a loud bellow. Exhausted. Sarah sat down in the high chair. She covered her head with her hands and monotonously repeated, changing from a whisper to a scream. Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! The remnants of her mind were sounding an alarm from somewhere far away. The cameras were here. But right now, Sarah didn't care. She rushed out of the room, closed the door so she wouldn't hear the child's bellowing, and dialed the babysitter's number. Salima, hello. Can you come over? What's wrong, Sarah? I'm out of town right now, she answered. Victoria, she's sitting there howling. I don't know how to calm her down, Sarah said irritably. Try petting her, hugging her, comforting her. She's very fond of affection and kind treatment. Like all children, Nanny replied. Talk to her, she is a human being, not a doll. Selena Sarah pleaded, hearing the deafening roar even through the closed door. Please come, I'll pay you. I have money. How much do you want? Sarah, if I wanted to. I couldn't leave my business and come here today. I've been asked to babysit another child. I can give you the number of an agency, see if they have any babysitters available. 
but I have to let Barry know. Notifying her husband and admitting her failure was the last thing Sarah wanted to do. She was still hoping to salvage her arrangement. On the other hand, why? Everything's falling apart, and what's left of it has to be saved. It's time to get off this sinking Titanic. How long does Austin have left? Three weeks? It's decided she's going with him. She'll take the money she's saved up so Barry can't take it away. Just to get through the three weeks without showing you've got a penny to your name. All the jewelry was hers by contract. The phone rang, the nanny sent the number as promised. Sarah looked into the bedroom. The girl was no longer crying. She was lying on the bed, sobbing slightly audibly and hiccuping. Finally, calm down thought Sarah, but she could not overpower herself and come to the girl. She opened the application of the bank to see how much money was left for her expenses. A hundred thousand a month. A hundred thousand. What a pittance. What can you buy with that money? Thinking some more, Sarah dialed the number of the agency. At the very least, she could say that Selena had advised her. And after all, who was the mistress of the house? She didn't even notice Mickey appearing next to her. After checking to see if everything was all right, the man looked into the girl's room. He went to the crib, touched the baby's forehead and splashed his hands. Sarah, get the water and vinegar, quickly. The girl froze in bewilderment. She wasn't going to follow orders. Then Mickey dashed into the kitchen, brought a dish of stinking water and began to wipe the girl, muttering something under his breath. Sarah sat down on the yellow couch and ticked off the minutes until the new nanny arrived. Mickey paced back and forth, ignoring her. He realized it was no use. Finally, the long-awaited doorbell rang. She's here, thought Sarah and ran to open the door. The nanny had indeed arrived, and with her a man with a suitcase in his hands. The red cross on the luggage and the ambulance standing next to it clearly indicated his profession. No dog? The doctor asked and unceremoniously headed toward the house. With a shrug of her shoulders, Sarah invited the nanny in as well. She spent the rest of the day in her room, leaving the sick girl in the care of the servants. It's your own fault, the girl muttered, you shouldn't have made a nanny out of me. Barry disappeared at work all week. One night though, Sarah went downstairs for a drink of water and found her husband asleep on the sofa in the living room. He hadn't even undressed. The girl stayed away from Victoria. She knew that her husband would not leave his favorite daughter unattended, and she was right. Selena came back. Meanwhile, during the day Sarah was slaving away. Without the boutiques, spas and restaurants, she was like a drug addict without a dose. She tried to take a walk in the shopping center, but it became quite bad. To walk in such an institution without money only traumatized her soul. She had managed to spend her limit in three days, even though she was saving a lot. So she thought. Sarah decided not to touch the hidden untouchable reserve. It would still come in handy. In the evening she'd go to Austin's. Sometimes she managed to sneak a little food for him. But now the meals were ordinary, no delicacies. Sarah complained endlessly to her lover about her unbearable life. Austin, I'm counting the days until you and I leave, and they just keep getting longer and longer. I'm going crazy. The young man consoled and gave advice, but at times it seemed to her that Austin was completely indifferent to her state of mind, referring to the preparation for exams. Searching for more money, Sarah slowly began to rummage through her husband's rooms and clothes. Wrinkling her nose, she shoved the thousand dollar bills back in, the change wouldn't even be enough to go to a cafe. On Austin's advice, she looked for papers that might be of some value. Then Austin said, they could be sold back to her husband. That's how she came across the prenuptial agreement that had been tossed on the shelf. She flopped down on the bed and began to scrutinize the lines. The girl was looking for at least some clue on which it will be possible to sue for money or property in a divorce. And on one of the closets, she broke into a cold sweat. According to the agreement, when the marriage was dissolved, Sarah would keep all of her belongings, no matter how valuable they were. Jewelry, clothes, even the Volkswagen she could keep, but only on one condition, the most important condition Barry had set for her. She had to fulfill her maternal duties to Victoria. Shit, damn it, how could I not have noticed before? How I forgot, Sarah was indignant. Even if she took the jewelry with her now, Barry could argue it in court and Sarah had no doubt that he would definitely come for what was his and would not give a penny for nothing. What was 400 kilometers to him, when more than 30 million was at stake? And she had a plan, 
For the last two weeks she would show herself a good mother and do it in front of acquaintances and strangers, wherever after they could confirm her words. On the one hand she realized the absurdity of the idea, but on the other it was at least a chance, a straw she was trying to grasp. Selena and Mickey were surprised at the change in Sarah's attitude toward Victoria, but they remained delicately silent. The girl read stories to the baby and played toys with her exclusively in the nursery, under the watchful eye of the baby monitor. She donated a $5,000 bill from her stash for entertainment on walks and buying treats. Sarah demonstrated her love for Victoria in front of everyone she knew, friends, neighbors, parents at daycare. Her well-honed skill of quick introductions and life experience helped her to organize entire performances in crowded places. They ended with five or six new phone numbers on the list. But if anyone knew how much effort Sarah made not to give away her true feelings, how much nerve it cost her every time she went for a walk. Restless, not too active three-year-old Victoria did not sit still for a minute. She was always running and falling somewhere, hiding and getting lost, climbing on various slides and trying to jump off. And she was always laughing. And she also asked her mother backpack to take everywhere with her favorite soft toy. It was a bunny about 30 centimeters high, white, with pink ears and paws, dressed in a blue turtleneck. She and Barry had bought it somewhere in Europe. On walks, Victoria took her pet out of her backpack, slapped it on damp benches and dirty roundabouts, dipped it in a glass of juice, and shoved it under the noses of small dogs walking peacefully on a leash. Too bad we can't put a collar and leash on her too, Sarah thought. Did you enjoy the walk? Every time Selena, whom the girl had deliberately not taken with her, asked. Yes, shouted Victoria, it was so much fun with mom. An exhausted Sarah, having given the baby to Selena, went to the bathtub to clean the white coat of the hair and console herself with the fact that soon everything would be over. In her spare time, she was working on an escape plan. It would seem easier to throw things into a suitcase and leave proudly. No one would not forbid or stop. But for some reason Sarah was afraid that Barry or his guards would start shaking the luggage and find cash, and there was a good amount of about 25 million. Besides, she didn't want her escape to be discovered at once, so she slowly, so as not to arouse suspicion, began to transport the most necessary things to Boston. At night she began to have nightmares. Sarah dreamed of Victoria falling from a height, breaking her bones, or even dying. She was being interrogated by her husband's security detail with special scrutiny. How she misses the train and, panting, runs after it, while the bag on wheels bounces funny on the sleepers. Sarah woke up in a cold sweat, fumbling around the double bed, hoping to snuggle into the strong male shoulder of Barry or Austin, whatever. When she couldn't find anyone, she'd get up and go to the dressing room to go through her riches. It calmed her down. And in the morning she would start all over again, socializing with Victoria, the contrived friendliness and slanted glances of the servants. But time does not stand still, and now the long-awaited day X is very close. Having sacrificed another $5,000, Sarah bought a travel bag. The day before the escape, she carefully filled it. She put some things on the bottom, then stacks of banknotes and covered it with things again. She sneaked into the garage, trying not to get caught by the surveillance cameras, and went to the train station. There she put the bag in the luggage room. Her hands were trembling slightly, and her heart was ready to jump out of her chest. Tomorrow everything would happen. The night was particularly painful in terms of dreams. Rolling around on the bed, Sarah waited for morning. She went down to the bathroom to clean herself up. Mommy, she heard a happy voice say. What a pestilence, she can't sleep, Sarah thought, and answered aloud. Hi, baby, how are you? Victoria began to chirp something, but Sarah was not interested. Where's Selena? She asked Mickey, who was at the stove. And why wasn't Victoria at daycare? It was the nanny's job to get the girl ready in the morning. Sarah couldn't bring herself to get up this early. The daycare center is quarantined and Selena took the day off, answered the all-knowing cook. You're so great with the girl that she's decided to do her own thing. The devil? Almost swore Sarah out loud. How to slip away without arousing suspicion. The train was leaving at noon. Time began to count down. Sarah threw a hateful glance at the girl, and then her head felt as if something had switched as if it had blown a fuse that held back all the negative emotions towards Victoria. She would punish the girl, she would punish her husband. She'd get revenge on them, let him have as much grief as she had in the last three weeks of her life. 
He eats in restaurants with his partners, and she eats this homemade, bland food. Trying not to show her excitement, Sarah went to the bathroom and from there she shouted, Victoria, sit down to eat and let's go for a walk. Maybe you shouldn't go out today. Mickey asked worriedly, there's a blizzard coming through the window. It's not far, we'll go to the local cafe, said Sarah. Then don't take the car, Mickey advised, but the girl just waved it away. The youth's backpack, a la sack love, was ready to take an important load. Sarah realized at the last moment that it was better to leave the boxes in the safe. Why? She couldn't explain it herself. Pulling several heavy freezer bags from the kitchen, Sarah carefully filled them with jewelry and stacked them in her backpack. She lined the perimeter with corrugated cardboard for rigidity and protection. She tossed the oversized cosmetic bag with its contents on top for secrecy. I covered it with a small towel and fastened the flap. The weight of the backpack felt good in my hand. Her heart was pounding frantically. Sacrificing minutes, Sarah made her way to the medicine cabinet and dosed herself with valerian. Then, looking carefully at the vial, she prepared the magic solution for Victoria. She would make her drink it on the way. The girl glanced at her watch. Time, time, time. The usually spree Victoria took forever this time to rummage around in the hallway. Sarah could barely contain her impatience, dragging her to the car. She put her in the infant seat in the backseat strapped her in. She tossed her and Victorine's two backpacks next to her. She held out a bottle with a couple sips of liquid splashing at the bottom. Here, drink it, it's magic water, the fairies made it. The little girl obediently drank, then grabbed her backpack and hugged it. Sarah drove the car out of the yard. The weather was indeed abominable. Gusty winds tossed hard snowflakes into the windshield by the handfuls. The windshield wipers, turned on full blast, had no time to clear the view. White snow flew up in jagged clumps, worsening the already poor visibility. Sarah stepped on the gas, and the car skidded slightly. You can't accelerate in these conditions. The girl twisted the steering wheel like a madwoman, trying to keep the Volkswagen on the road. Thankfully, it was the outskirts, and there were no people willing to walk in such weather. Then it will be five kilometers on the highway to the city, then through the city. I've got to make it. Two hours to spare. Standing at the intersection on the main road, Sarah watched the cars as if to emerge from the snow shroud, crawling past and again hidden in the thick veil. It was difficult to cut into this flow. The girl pressed the gas and turned the steering wheel. It seemed to fit, and even without problems. She drove the car, trying not to lose sight of the red lights ahead. Victoria was squirming and sniffling in the back. Whatever, she should be asleep soon, as long as the dosage wasn't too high. Sarah didn't want the girl to die, if only because she knew Barry's reaction with 100% certainty. There are all sorts of people in his security detail, including badasses capable of following any order. The girl was thinking so hard that she didn't notice the stop light on the car in front of her. She swore and sharply pressed the brake, but the car only wiggled backwards, not wanting to stop. To avoid a collision, Sarah twisted the steering wheel toward the curb. The VVW spun and plowed into a snowdrift. The compacted snow quickly damped the low speed, preventing the car from flipping over or going into the ditch. Sarah opened the door and quietly howled. Her car was stuck up to its belly, no way to get out. The city was just around the corner, and if she ran, she could take public transportation to the train station. Sarah crawled out of the car and found herself knee-deep in snow. The cold wind, as if resenting her, immediately threw a batch of piercing ice flakes in her face. They burned her face with a sharp pain. The frost crept under her stable coat and into her felt gloves. Covering her eyes with her hand, Sarah stumbled and fell to the back door. Mommy, why are we going? Asked a name Victoria, drumming her feet impatiently on the seat. Why don't we leave her here? Sarah had a funny thought. Someone will stop and pick her up. They wouldn't leave the car in a snowdrift for long. Another gust threw ice flakes into the cabin and they seemed to reach the girl. Mommy? Victoria Winthrop and pulled her arms around Sarah. The feelings came in a new wave. No, they'll find you too soon, she muttered and unbuckled the straps. What hatred compelled her to carry such a load? Sarah grabbed the two backpacks in one hand and raked the girl in the other, tucking her under her arm, and started to make her way out to the road. The little girl whimpered, but at least she didn't latch out. The wind was now a tailwind, whipping and pushing at her back, Sarah was almost to the edge of the road when she reached the entrance to the town and stopped to look around. 
The door of the car next to her opened. Young lady, where are you going? Do you need a ride? A woman sitting in the passenger seat asked. I have to go to the station, Sarah said I'll pay, especially if you drive me fast. Come on, get in quickly, while we're standing in traffic. Sarah didn't have to be persuaded. Half a minute and she and Victoria were already sitting in the warm cabin. Mommy, the little girl kept rubbing her eyes with her hands. Now now, Sarah stroked her head and held her close. She went through her pockets, took out a thousand dollar bill and handed it to the driver. Is this enough? Please, we're late. The man looked questioningly at his companion, and she nodded. They reached the station without any adventures, though not quickly. Oh, she fell asleep, the woman said, looking at Vika, let me help. She put the baby on Sarah's shoulder and handed the backpacks to her. In this part of the city the wind was not so vicious, and the icy drops fell in a slanting rain. The girl had already learned the station area, camera locations and blind spots by heart. Here was just such a one. Two benches drowned in snow and surrounded by mossy Christmas trees. Behind them, the suburban train station building. Sarah went a little deeper into the snowdrift, where no man had ever set foot in winter. Soon the snow would cover her tracks. Feeling like a fair stepmother, Sarah put the sleeping girl under the tree so that she would not be immediately visible from the road. She put the baby's backpack on her lap and hugged it with her sluggish arms. She went out to the road, looked around, People rarely walked in this part of the country in winter, and that was the expectation. Without feeling any remorse, Sarah went towards the station, where her beloved was waiting for her. It's 15 minutes to departure, Austin greeted her. Sarah threw herself into his arms, their lips kissed. That's it, true happiness. Come on, let's hurry up, Austin pulled away from her, we have to get the bag out of the luggage room. Oh, Sarah realized, I completely forgot about you. Let's go. Two minutes before the train was due to leave, they jumped into the car and found a seat. Sarah made herself comfortable on her lover's shoulder. A sleepless night, sedatives and light rocking under the rhythmic tapping did their job, and the girl slowly began to sink into sleep. The train, as in a fairy tale, carried them through the snow to the beautiful far away. A ray of the morning sun, having hardly broken through the dense clouds and snow veil, illuminated a small room in an old paneled house. Its decoration had not been touched by a strong master's hand for a long time. The paint that had peeled off the window frames lay in pieces on the cracked windowsill next to an old flower pot, the plant in which had long since withered and hung over the edge. The faded chintz curtains were torn from their fastenings and hung in shapeless old rags. The tarnished gray ceiling and the walls were covered with mold. The linens that made up the beveled bed were worn to holes. The closet doors were torn off their hinges. There were icons and a small volume of the Bible on a worn table next to a water-filled glass and packets of pills. A man sat in a chair next to it. He could well be called an old man because of his slumped back, gray hair, and deep wrinkles. His long unshaven face and staring eyes gave away the weariness of life. The old man rolled around on his bed all night and only dozed off in the morning. It was then that he saw this vivid, memorable dream. Then. Looking at the gray ceiling and remembering the details, the old man could not understand for a long time whether it was a dream or real. They were walking on a green lawn, flooded with dazzling warm light. On either side of the green lawn rose a mighty wall of trees. Their tops clung to the clouds, a light yellowish mist hiding the horizon. They were himself, Anthony, and his long-missing daughter Sophia. Here she was a very young girl of about 16, ghostly in a white airy dress. Daughter. When will you finally invite your father to your house? Asked the old man. Wait daddy, it's not time yet, she replied laughing. Then at least tell me how you live, because we haven't seen each other for a long time. I'm very happy, papa, really, I feel so good. Are you embarrassed to be an old man? Or maybe someone doesn't let you. So you tell me, I'll come and sort it out. Sophia laughed back. Then suddenly she got serious and wagged her finger. Don't you dare daddy, you hear me? I told you it's too early for you to come to me, but I need your help. He was about to ask about everything, but the annoying buzzing of the negro's perforator destroyed this little paradise. So what kind of help do you need, my daughter? The old man said, stroking the icons. He came home from the hospital two weeks ago after suffering a heart attack. All this time, he wondered why he'd been dragged out. He was so tired of the hopeless loneliness and hardly touched the medication he was given. Sleep seemed to bring him back to life. 
The old man took out a couple of pills in the palm of his hand and drank them with water. The house was near the train station. The incessant clattering of the wheels had become a familiar background sound. Sometimes, when heavy trains passed by, the house shook and the dishes rattled. The tenants didn't stay here for long, they were looking for more comfortable conditions. Left alone, Anthony thought of changing the two-room apartment for something cheaper, but the thought that his daughter would come back one day and find strangers stopped him. After paying for the apartment, the rest of his pension was enough for a very modest life. We should go and see Betty today, Anthony thought. Betty, a brisk saleswoman, had become good friends with the old man, and she used to give him the expired goods she had prepared to throw away. Anthony warmly recalled how timidly, afraid to offend, she did it the first time, but soon such delicacies as sausage, cheese, cottage cheese began to appear in his refrigerator. And is two or three days overdue? It could be a week. It doesn't smell, and there's no mold. And even if there is, you peel it off, and there you go, a good product again. After a quick breakfast, Anthony went outside. The weather was, as they call it, unpleasant. Slowly moving with the support of a cane, the old man went to the streetcar stop. Hey, Grandpa. Someone called him halfway. Are you going to the streetcars? So they're stopped. There's some kind of accident. Anthony thanked him and sighed heavily. But once he'd gone out, he couldn't go back. He could take the bus, but the stop was somewhere else. How his fee had brought him to this deserted part of the station, he did not realize. He just wondered. He stopped to look at the winter beauty of the Christmas trees. Under one of them lay a large blue bag. No way, what terrorists have left, thought Anthony. But should he be afraid of such things? He crept along the lightly trampled path and gasped. Under the tree slept a small child, a girl, judging by the clothes, and a funny backpack. Oh, how did you get here? Anthony said, trying to pull the girl out of the snow. Come on, get up, they're probably looking for you. Hey, nice man, he turned to some kid. Please help me carry the girl to the station. Here, 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 sit down next to the radiator. Thank you. Wailing, the old man shook off his fine. When the snow melts, the girl will get wet. He touched her cheeks and her hands were icy. He warmed her palms with his breath. He took off his boots, cleaned them thoroughly and put them on the radiator, followed by warm socks. No, I don't think my feet are too cold yet. What the hell happened? Anthony began to look around. The crowd was going about its business. People were wobbling or running, shouting or sitting quietly, staring at their phones. No one cared about grandfather and granddaughter. Let them warm themselves. The station is common. It's not a pity. We should give her to the police as a lost person. And Kate's mom had already run off her feet. But time passed, and no one announced the search for the child. The girl began to wake up. Anthony looked at her and realized he wanted to be near her. Always. Protect her from harm and give her happiness. But where would he go? A sick, poor old man. Mama. The little girl called out. Now, now, quietly, so as not to attract attention, said Anthony. Get up, let's go to mommy. He put on the girl's socks and boots warm on the radiator, and they left the station. In the fresh frosty air, the girl finally woke up and walked beside in a sprint. That's his dragonfly, thought Anthony with kindness, eye and eye is needed. His Sophia at that age was the same, and not only at that age. The old man left the girl in the room and went to the kitchen. There is milk and cereal, we can boil porridge. He was absorbed in the process and thinking. Meanwhile, the room was silent, a suspicious silence for an active little child. Trying not to bang his cane too hard, Anthony cautiously peered into the room. What he saw stunned him. The small patch of old shabby room looked like an illustration from a Latin book. A girl sat in the center, surrounded by glittering piles of jewels. Every now and then she took out of them a ring shimmering with different colors, or a chain glittering with gold, and tried it on herself, sniffing with eagerness. The sight of the scattering of precious metal and stones made Anthony's legs weak and breathless. He realized there was a fortune here, and more than one. Is Mama here? The girl asked carelessly. Barry was finishing his report when there was a knock on his office door. The visitor was Harry, an old army friend, formerly a GRU officer, now the firm's head of security, but more of an agent at large. We found her, he said. Bring her to my house. Both of them, Barry ordered after hearing the report. Harry nodded and headed for the door. Harry, Barry called out to him, snapping his fingers for attention. 
take Selena with you. He waited until the door closed and walked over to the window. The foul wind had died down, and sporadic friendly snowflakes swirled in the air. The traffic congestion caused by the inclement weather would soon end. Most likely, the customers would arrive on time. In these three weeks, he had fallen completely out of life, trying to keep the firm afloat with his partner. Everything but the main problem ceased to exist for him. Sometimes he didn't realize whether it was morning or evening, and he only went home to tidy up and change his clothes. He'd pick up Mickey's carefully prepared containers of food to eat in between. But now thanks to their efforts, the ripples beneath their feet were firm again. Anthony hobbled to the endlessly rattling sound of the doorbell. Mommy, Bunny, jumping on the broken bed and clapping her hands, Victoria shouted joyfully. Three people entered the apartment, a woman, to whom the girl immediately rushed with an exclamation, Nanny Selena, and two men with army dressing. The latter unceremoniously went to inspect the room. Anthony looked longingly at the scene. He realized that sooner or later he would have to part with Victoria. But the girl had been found by her loved ones, and that was the main thing. The old man went to the closet and pulled out two bags of jewelry on the table. Here, he said, this was in her backpack. Harry walked into the room where Celine was dressing the girl and whistled. Where did this come from? He asked, nodding at the bags. I took them from my mom when I was in the car with her, Victoria said. I took them to try on, and I put my bunny in her purse. This is going to be a surprise for someone. Harry laughed heartily. Come on, grandfather, you're coming with us. What do you need before? Why? You'll get a reward for the fine, Harry said, either jokingly or seriously. Barry drove home, knowing he was expected and that his guest was acting strange. The old man rushed to him from the doorstep. He scrutinized his face, tears streaking down his cheeks. In his hands, he held the very same cherished photograph that Barry had returned from his study to the mantelpiece. Where? Where is she? He was pointing his finger at the picture of the girl, Barry's first wife. Tell me, where is she? Where's my Sophia, my little girl? The ambulance from the private clinic had already left. Anthony, drugged, gradually calmed down and came to his senses. She disappeared how many years ago, he answered Barry's request. I don't remember how long. She lived apart, rarely called, and we didn't realize it right away. We searched long and hard through the classifieds, the newspapers, the police. Nothing. My wife couldn't bear such grief, went sick, and then she went to heaven. After that, I became a pitiful shadow of myself. But the bony one won't take me, and I'm trampling this earth for nothing. Barry swallowed another lump in his throat. All this time he had been running from the past and chasing it at the same time. Keeping the memory alive and afraid to remember. Forbidden to speak, not because it was a secret, but because the memories were tearing at his wounds and tearing his soul to shreds. But now it was time. We met far away from here, he began his story, a thousand kilometers away, practically in a resort town. I was on a business trip, working as a leading economist. When I saw her, I fell in love like a boy. She couldn't tell me anything about herself, amnesia after the car accident. No main, no family, no address. Her memory of the past like a blank slate. We waited to find her, we looked for her ourselves. I didn't have the opportunities I have now. Barry was silent. Then he took a vacation and spent a month driving his beloved around the city, through all the nooks and crannies, hoping that the memory would catch on some little thing and be restored. It turns out that without knowing it, he brought her back to her hometown. They were looking for her past there when they should have been here. Where is she? The old man asked in a colorless voice. We lived with her for four happy years, Barry continued, feeling the urge to talk, to get the pain out of himself, everything I have now. Money, a house, I owe it all to her. He moved over to the old man on the couch and took his hand. His pulse seemed to have evened out, and the truth can and should be told. Be strong, father. She's no longer with us. She left this world during childbirth. The trauma of the accident had taken its toll. They were silent. All of them. Mickey, Selena, Harry. It was as if they wanted to honor a girl they didn't even know. The silence was interrupted by Victoria. She flew out of the nursery and screamed with joy. Daddy, look what a bunny I drew. When mom will bring it to me? I'm bored. Is that her daughter? Anthony asked in a trembling voice. Yes, Barry answered briefly. Can I give her a hug? A week later, Barry was standing at the coffee table in the living room, looking at the documents the courier had brought from the forensics lab. 
Harry was sitting on the sofa with his feet up in the American way. His traveling clothes and the stubble on his face made it clear that he preferred the business trip report to a vacation. On the floor was a small sports bag in which the special agent had taken the payoff. Well, what is it? Harry asked in an indifferent tone. A coincidence in the family lines answered Barry, he is indeed her grandfather. What have you got? He took the weighty folder from his buddy's hands and sat down in the chair. Lots of seals, signatures of witnesses, notary, lawyer, and Sarah herself. The girl had fully accepted Barry's terms and hadn't made a single correction. The final divorce after three months was now a mere formality. Wow, Barry marveled. You're insulting me, Chief, Harry said carelessly. If I take on something, I do it. I'm afraid to ask how you did it. I could tell you that no one was physically hurt, but you wouldn't believe me. And how much was it? Barry asked. Well, we gave her back the money we had taken from the luggage locker at the train station. Harry began to recount in an indifferent tone, added the value of the Volkswagen and her jewelry, taking into account the wear and tear. What wear and tear? Barry interrupted in surprise. 30%, Harry spelled it out. You won't be able to sell them for full price. I won't be able to, Barry grinned ironically. I can't, and not just for the full amount. This jewelry has even gone up in value lately. You have to be warned about such things, chief. Harry's slay look and slay smile had no hint of regret. Where was I? Oh yes, you owe me for gas, two visits to the cafe, and the gazelle. What gazelle? Barry was surprised again. Well, your madam demanded to return all her clothes, and they didn't fit in any car, not even in our fishing SUV, can you imagine? We had to hire a gazelle, where she's gonna cram it all in now, I can't imagine. And she didn't ask for anything more than that? Barry didn't expect to get off so lightly. Harry suddenly changed the subject. Do you remember the hair your little girl left this one? I said I'd buy it for a fabulous price, as if it were studded with diamonds. It's gone. She threw it away. Well, I'm sorry, beautiful, then you're out of luck. Don't worry, chief. The money she has now will last her the rest of her life. With proper savings, of course. By the way, I've got a surprise. Harry pulled a familiar hair out of his bag, carefully wrapped in a sealed bag that was tied with twine. Wow, Barry marveled, you said. Where from? I hired every bum in town. It took me five hours to find it. Can you believe it? Barry laughed and began to untie the rope. Harry shouted, jumping up from the couch. Don't, don't untie it. He needs to be clean first. I got it. Barry replied and put the toy aside. I'm done, Harry summarized. He stood up, pulling on his sweater in a military fashion. Permission to go. Bye, Barry replied. Left alone, he picked up the bag hair and thought. The toy was dirty, torn in places. Nothing that wouldn't be cleaned up at the dry cleaners would remain as battle scars. And Selena would then come up with a whole story about how the courageous hair got home to his favorite mistress. Life was getting better. The business suffered, but not lost. Now it will not give the previous income, but the rest is enough for a decent standard of living. With many of the property had to part with, but Barry was not sorry. He was ready to sell the house as well, but he didn't have to. The house. Every inch of it reminded him of her and their four years together. He dreamed of building a palace for his beloved, but she wouldn't stand by. It was she who supervised the workers and the construction, checked the estimates, and she was the one who furnished the entire house. I didn't get it all done. It was with her support that he found the strength to quit his job and plunge into the world of business. What did the doctor say? With those injuries, especially to the brain, she should have died at the crash site. It was like she was living on borrowed time, like she hadn't done her duty on this earth, and she could die any minute, the doctor said. She knew, she accepted it, and she learned to live with it. Maybe it's time for him to accept reality. Who was he trying to deceive by bringing Sarah in with the expectation that she'd be a worthy replacement? Himself or fate? I wonder, if it weren't for the firm, how long would Sarah have lived with him? At a certain point, her appetites became too big for her to handle, and Barry had to take money out of the business. Victoria may have to grow up without her mom, but it's better than what he was trying to slip her. Barry didn't worry about his daughter's future, there would always be people close to her who would support her in any situation. Him. Selena. She had grown fond of the girl during this time, agreed to be called grandmother and to stay here. 
and she and Barry's views on parenting were surprisingly similar. Anthony or Grandpa. His eyes brightened, his back straightened, and he grew wings. And Mickey. Even though he's a walk-in, he's got a thing for the little girl. Together they'll manage. The man went to the mantelpiece and picked up the photograph. Please forgive me, he whispered, looking at his beloved's happy face, I made a mistake. I promise it won't happen again. And you please, keep an eye on our daughter from up there, from heaven. However, Jackie said that's how they met. Like, she was a model who was about to finally leave the business that was boring her, and he was a successful banker who managed several branches of one of the largest banks in the country. The husband told her that they met at some art exhibition, either dedicated to Impressionism or vice versa. It was something related to folk crafts. Jackie told her that he didn't remember exactly. Victoria stood next to the high panoramic window and thoughtfully looked into the distance. There, where in the depths of her and her husband's large and flowering garden, there was a small beautiful lake in which huge rainbow carp slowly swam. Here, look how handsome they are, he said, hugging her, Jack. They were bought especially for you, so that you could come here at any time and watch our family in miniature. Jack smiled and pointed out to the young woman a pair of beautiful fish moving smoothly under the glass smooth water column. Look, the bigger one is like me, the husband continued. But this beauty with iridescent sides is you, Victoria, his female, his legal wife. You see how happy they are, just like you and me, Victoria. Then for a long time I looked at the majestic Pisces and thought that she too was now floating in the same way in the middle of the unknown of her own life. And just like these carps, it does not remember itself. Leichen's loud Katie, the woman slowly shifted her focus from her gaze to the reflection in the window. Tall, almost model height, slender like a tree trunk. Victoria, she had truly beautiful appearance. The platinum blonde who turned 25 last year looks like she stepped straight out of the pages of a fashion magazine. I would like to remember at least something from all this, I thought to myself with bitterness. However, no matter how much the businessman's wife strained her memory, no matter how much she tried to reconstruct the events of that fateful day when she was in a terrible car accident and almost completely lost her memory, nothing I couldn't remember other than my name. Her first memory, after she finally came to her senses, was the long road home. The woman remembered the cozy interior of an expensive car in which her husband drove her to their luxurious country mansion, located in one of the most closed and carefully guarded cottage communities. Next to her in the car sat a middle-aged woman, dressed in a chic three-piece sky blue suit. Her hair was perfectly styled, and her makeup could have been the envy of the Queen of England herself. Stands a lady looked to be about 50, but she had a figure like that of Hollywood stars. Fit, slender, with a minimum number of wrinkles, on a beautiful but slightly cold face, it later turned out that it was the mother Jack Zoe. The banker's mother owned a large spa complex, so in matters of youth and beauty she really had no equal, at least in their city. After they arrived home, Jack Wizzoi told her in more detail about what happened to her. Honey, it's normal that you feel a little lost, her husband explained to her. The accident you and your driver got into was simply monstrous. The driver died on the spot. And you, Jackie, hesitated, as if it was hard for him to talk about it, and he did not know how to choose the right words so as not to shock his already confused wife. They literally put you back together piece by piece. Your brain was severely damaged, and after doctors performed several complex operations, you had to be put into an artificial coma. Otherwise, you simply wouldn't have survived, my dear. Zoe, who was sitting right there, just silently lowered her eyes and put her palm to her forehead, as if she herself suddenly felt bad from the surge of worries for her daughter-in-law. You were in a coma for almost six months, she said quietly. My son visited you every day in the hope that your condition would finally improve enough to wake you up. However, at first, the doctors did not give positive prognoses. They said that the chances of making it through were simply scanty, and you could, Victoria, you have conquered death. Well done. When Zoe Konstantinovna looked again at Victoria, there were tears in her eyes. She immediately approached her daughter-in-law and sincerely hugged her. Victoria, there was no choice but to respond to this gesture with a much less tight hug of his own. I've been waiting for you so much, Victoria, said meanwhile Jack, and he also wiped tears from the corners of his eyes. You just can't imagine how long I've been waiting. Mom says it right, even the doctors despaired, but I still believed believed that you would come back to me. Honey, thank God that's what happened. Now you are home, and I will never let you suffer again. Never. 
The young woman looked at her husband, and for a tiny moment it suddenly seemed to her that she had already heard something like that. But it was under completely different circumstances in which ones, alas, she did not remember at all. She herself felt as if she had slept for several decades in a row, and when she woke up she found herself in a completely different time and place than where she had once fallen asleep. The woman was haunted by a constant feeling of lethargy and physical weakness, and everything around her seemed somehow completely different from what it should have been. Thank you. Thanks to both of you, answered slowly Victoria. And the mother-in-law finally released her from her two strong hands. The young woman smiled faintly and added to her husband, I must be very lucky to have such a sensitive and caring family. I will try to remember you, you and everything that happened before this terrible accident. I promise. Zoe, my son, and I quickly looked at each other, but the next second, a happy smile flashed on the face of the husband and mother-in-law. Of course, darling, the woman sang, taking her hand. We have no doubt about it. Jack will help you fill in all the gaps that have formed in your memory after the coma. To be honest, we have already prepared a little for this. So once you are completely ready to start, just tell us, do you, Libesis? The mother-in-law was taken aback for a moment, as if she did not expect such tactlessness from her daughter-in-law. But then, realizing that this was just an ordinary question, Zoe softened. That's right, dear me, and you, and our Jack. We all live together in this wonderful house. I'll keep an eye on you if you don't mind, she said, looking carefully at her daughter-in-law. Jack, we are at work all day. In addition, he is often sent on business trips, including abroad. I think it will be better this way. Victoria turned a questioning glance from her to her husband, and he confirmed his mother's words. Darling, you have absolutely nothing to worry about. I'm taking some time off now, but I'll have to go back to the office in a couple of weeks. I want to be absolutely sure that nothing happens to you while I'm not home. Mom kindly agreed to help me with this, although her worries are beyond the roof. I'm sure you and Mom will have a great time together. Even before the accident, you were inseparable, real girlfriends. Jack laughed a low, pure laugh, while looking at his mother as if he was looking for her support. She didn't keep herself waiting, and so I laughed, too. Of course, you and I will discuss so many things. We will prepare so many delicious things. You won't be bored with me, that's for sure. Other in law patted softly Victoria on the hand, but it seemed to her that the woman did this too faintly, as if talking about their friendship. The husband nevertheless embellished the true words somewhat so he under attitude one way or another. But then she did not say anything, but only gave her loved ones another weak smile. She is really very tired and the only thing she really, really wanted at that moment was just to get some sleep. Related Victoria did not resist the Desiree and took her to the room designated for her. Almost a year has passed since that moment, but the young woman has not advanced one iota in her numerous attempts to remember life before the moment of the accident. It's as if someone deliberately separated these two halves with an invisible line, and everything that came before was irretrievably lost. Her husband helped her as best he could, showing her a wedding album, which contained many photographs of both the celebration itself and afterwards from their everyday life. Here they are, happy and incredibly beautiful, posing for a photographer, surrounded by two dozen friends, Victoria. She wore a gorgeous designer dress the color of baked milk, completely embroidered with silk and silver crystals that folded into a whimsical and slightly reminiscent of Scandinavian patterns. You are so beautiful here, Na, kissing his wife he whispered to Jack. I just gently dodged. She was not yet ready to get closer to her husband the way he would like. Too little time had passed, and she had not yet had time to get used to him again or feel the feelings that had connected them, as he claimed for three long years. I'm sorry, she said quietly, Victoria. But the husband did not seem to hear this, continuing to try to establish closer communication with his wife. He tried to hug her, but the woman pulled away more insistently. No, Jack, please. I can't. But I love you. Mm. He answered her stupidly, slightly upset Jack, by his face. The woman realized that he had been waiting for this moment for a very long time, and now all he could do was look back at their wedding photos in disappointment. Okay, he said dryly. But did you remember anything? And you can't hide from me forever. After all, I am your husband. You don't need to be afraid of me. But maybe if we started living together again as before you would quickly be able not only to remember, but also to feel for me the same love that I feel for you every day. Victoria, I felt bad at heart. 
She really wanted all those wonderful, sublime feelings he spoke about to return to her memory, Jack. But looking at the multicolored photographs, she felt absolutely nothing, anyone, even the slightest glimpse of memory about Victoriashi was terribly ashamed, so she could only shake. That's what I thought, said the husband in much colder tone. Sometimes it seems to me that you don't even try to remember anything. I understand this is hard for you, but you could just try to trust me and your mom, since your memory still doesn't want to come back to you. Look at your right hand. Victoriashi obediently stared at her right hand, where her wedding ring with a huge pink diamond was on her ring finger. Jackie caught her glance and nodded curtly. You see, I gave you this ring on the day I proposed to you. You were happy to receive it. So happy that she immediately told me yes, said Jack. Hmm. She tried to justify herself, but her husband motioned for her to shut up. Please let me finish, he said, and a mournful expression instantly spread across his face. You don't remember now, but you and I have always been part of one whole. We loved each other so much that we even wrote special vows for each other for our wedding. Jackie looked for something in my wife's toilet cabinet and took out a large envelope. Inside was a sheet of coated paper neatly folded in half. On the sheet of paper was a love letter typed on a typewriter in which Victoria explained her feelings to her future husband. Here, read this carefully, her husband asked. If this doesn't bring back even a little memory of how happy we were, then I'm asking, no, I'm begging you, just take my word for it. I love you, I love you more than anything in the world, and it will always be that way. With these words, the man left his wife's room, leaving her alone with the wedding vows and his far from rosy thoughts. Victoria read the message to my husband and cried. She cried because she couldn't remember either how she wrote it or what she felt. The oath was truly beautiful. So pure, so sincere. Lord, why? I don't remember any of this. I asked both myself and God the same question. Why can't I love my husband again and remember him? Her mother-in-law's advice didn't help either, although they cooked together in the spacious kitchen and went out into the city together to visit the places that, as she assured her, Zoe loved most of all. It was all useless. Incidentoriate was as if there was a huge stone wall that did not allow her to look into the depths of her own memory and remember everything, wherein Victoriashi was not left alone for a minute. Either her mother-in-law or herself was always. My husband and I went to the city to unwind a couple of times a week. There they went shopping and to restaurants. Or Jack tried to spend time with his wife visiting theaters, cinema, and exhibitions. She was very grateful to her husband for his work, but did not understand why she could not do everything the same. But on her own, without his presence, layman wanted a little freedom, personal space. She hoped unsuccessfully that if she could be alone with her thoughts, then her memory might return to her much faster. No, honey, that's impossible. Repeated to her over and over again, Jack. You are still too weak and cannot fully control yourself. What if you get some kind of dizziness? Or, God forbid, will you completely lose consciousness and fall into a coma again, for darling? I won't survive this, you know, but I'll still have to go out in public alone sooner or later. You can't lock me in our house forever. Just thinking about it immediately made me shudder. She suddenly realized that, it turns out, she couldn't stand closed spaces and loneliness. Jack Butt, seeing his wife's reaction to his words, he instantly became nervous with irritation. First, the corner of his eye even twitched. Hey, what's happened? Did you remember something? He asked, somehow strangely. No, she answered. Why are you asking? Ends of the wristband immediately relaxed noticeably and said more softly, I thought you felt something new. Maybe she remembered how you and I already argued in a similar way. Victoria shook her head negatively, not really. But you're right. I realized that I couldn't be alone for too long. Then something seemed to push the woman from within, and she looked carefully at her husband, Jack, and why during all this time none of my friends ever called me? Do I have no friends? The phone number you gave me. There's no one in the contact list except you and Zoe. What about my parents? Where are they, Jack? There were so many questions that Jack involuntarily began to walk around the room where they were talking. It was just one of those evenings when they were planning to go to the premiere of the Capitals play, which was touring their city. The man noticeably perked up and kept tugging at his cuffs in excitement, pretending to adjust his emerald cufflinks. What is it, dear? I didn't understand, Victoria. Is there something you haven't told me yet, Jack? I will not leave here until I find out the whole truth. Jackie looked nervously at his wife, and in her soul there was an unpleasant feeling, a feeling that they were clearly hiding something from her. 
It's just that you've chosen the wrong time for this conversation, he finally said, Dak. We're going to the theater now, and you're here about your parents and friends. Let's talk later. I felt a sudden attack of anger and irritation. She stomped her foot hard on the carpet, but I want to know, have pity on me. I've been living in the dark for a year now and don't know who I am or what I am. I didn't ask because I thought it would be too hard for me and because I thought I would remember everything on my own, but nothing works. I don't know what to do next, how to get my memory back. Victoria, she felt herself begin to shake. She was clearly starting to get hysterical. And my husband fortunately also understood this. Jack jumped up to Victoria and hugged her tightly, trying to warm her and calm her trembling. Red it was like a stretched ringing string. She couldn't control her own body. He stroked his wife on, that's what I was talking about. It's too early for you to be alone. I was hoping you could remember bits and pieces of the main thing. Then set her down on the bed and said in a soft but sad voice, your parents, they died long ago. It was a hiking accident. Your mom and dad were mountain lovers and often kayaked in wild river areas. One day their boat couldn't withstand one of the rapids and capsized. She looked at her husband with red eyes from tears. Did they drown? He nodded sadly and stroked Victoria on the cheek. The river was very cold, and in those places the current was very strong. Their death was inevitable. I'm sorry, honey, I'm so sorry. Victoria burst into tears and buried her face in her husband's shoulder. Lord, what a nightmare. Oh, how long ago did this happen? A long time ago, honey. You were only 20 then. You told me about it yourself. Jackson Lee stroked his wife's head and whispered soothing words into her ear. Then, he said carefully, as for your friends, I bought you a new phone because your previous one was broken during an accident. There are no other contacts in it, since I didn't want anyone to bother you again during your rehabilitation. Victoria, she calmed down a little and, wiping her tears, said, Exactly. But I didn't even think about it. I'm sorry, Jack. I am very ashamed that I could think badly of you. I really decided that you wanted to hide something from me. The husband just smiled affectionately and suggested, If you want to meet your friends, then so be it. I'll tell them your new number. But just be sure to stay in touch. When I walk, I need to know that you're okay, you know? Nodded. This news made her feel a little lighter. Well, that's nice, the husband said contentedly. You know, I changed my mind about going to the theater today. I think we've had enough emotions for this evening. Let me give you the sedative a doctor prescribed and then we'll go to bed early. Is that okay? I thought about it and agreed. She really is very emotional about you. The husband assured her that he was not at all offended by his wife's suspicion, like he understands everything. Still, living without a past is such stress. Having given my wife an injection, Jack breathed out a sigh of relief when she fell into a blissful sleep within a few minutes. That evening, he realized for the first time that he was with Victoria, there is still a long way to go before she finally comes to terms with the fact that her true place is in this house and in his, and only his, heart. That same night, Victoria, I saw a very strange dream, which later I could not get out of my head. In that dream, she couldn't understand where exactly she was. Everything around her was engulfed in bright orange flashes, and the woman herself could not breathe normally because of the smoke that had entered her lungs. Glitter and acrid, this smoke enveloped all the objects that the businessman's wife tried to reach in a fruitless attempt to save them from the approaching flame. I felt the ever-increasing heat on my skin, but did not see a way out of the smoky space. Then, as if out of nowhere, two blurry figures appeared in front of her. I couldn't see exactly what they looked like, but I felt that one of them, the taller one, was a man, and the second, very small, clearly belonged to a child. Victoria, I heard a strong male voice ahead of me, where are you, Victoria? The voice repeated her name over and over again. She didn't try to quickly shout, I'm here, but not a single sound escaped her throat. In desperation, the woman grabbed her own neck and suddenly heard a piercing childish voice, Mommy, and she began to rush around in the blinding, fiery fog, trying to reach or at least get closer to those ghostly figures that were calling her. She understood in her soul that she definitely needed to give them a sign that she was here, that she was alive and that everything was fine with her. However, the blurry silhouettes moved further away the closer I tried to get to them, Victoria. Finally, experiencing a surge of inhuman despair, the woman screamed into the void, watching the figures move away and dissolve in the smoke. Wait, wait, please don't leave me here. No, I want to come to you. Wake up, called her Jack. And at that moment, the woman opened her huge blue eye. 
It turned out that she was still lying in her bed, and her husband was sitting next to her, bending over her, and forcefully shaking her shoulders so that she would wake up. Anxiety and sadness were clearly visible on the husband's face. Then, what's wrong with you? What did you see? The wife, not yet fully awakened from what she had seen, just shook her head and pulled her husband's hands away from her. I, everything is fine, Jack. Nothing. I just had a nightmare. The young woman regained her breath with difficulty and looked tenderly at her husband. No, don't worry, give me a couple of minutes. Mateen, fine. Likori, as she turned on her other side, trying to cope with the feelings that rushed over her. What she saw in the dream was so vivid and realistic that the woman could not move away from the thought that it could very well be a memory. Just what? And why didn't she see in this strange dream jack as if he had nothing to do with it at all. Are you sure you don't need sedatives? I could get you some pills if you want. Looked at her husband with outright surprise. Are you serious, honey? Do you want to turn me into a vegetable? Backenst for a moment, but laughed lightly and threw a pillow at him. Yes, I was just joking, fool. Of course, I don't mean anything like that. Well, really, it's just a bad dream. There is no need to take pills every time I feel emotions. Jackie smiled, but somehow not joyfully as if he felt guilty about something. However, quickly pretending that nothing had happened, he invited his beloved wife to drink coffee together. I um, even baked cheesecakes for us today before rushing off to work. As long as I have lived, I am always amazed at her amazing ability to combine the talents of a housewife and a businesswoman. God, how embarrassing. Mm -hmm. Pressing her hands to her face, she said, Victoria, it was I who had to get up early and prepare everything. Instead, you also have to strain your mother in the kitchen. Jackie just waved his hand, after which he tenderly kissed his wife on the cheek. You just don't know her as I do. In fact, all this amateur activity with Potts has always been a joy for her. Before my father died, she was an ordinary housewife for a long time, raised me, looked after my dad when he came home from work, and then when her father died of a heart attack, she took the business seriously. Dad left us some inheritance. She used this money to open her first beauty salon. Vat Victoria looked at her husband with sincere interest. This was the first time he had told her so openly about his family, and I was still just a boy then, about 17 years old. At first, I couldn't accept this new form of my mother, and then she clearly explained to me that in this life you need to fight for yours to the end, gnawing it with your teeth but not giving it to anyone. So, I first entered college at the Faculty of Economics, and then got a job in a bank. But gradually, I became one of the people and met you. Jack hugged with tenderness Victoria, and she allowed herself to be kissed for real. At some point, the woman thought that the dream she had was really just a meaningless nightmare. A couple of hours later, when the husband was already getting ready for work, the fun of Victoria suddenly burst out an insistent third. Looking at the screen, the woman was surprised to find that they were calling her from an unknown number. Pick up the phone, he advised her. Jack throwing his jacket over his shoulders. I'm sure you're happy about who's calling you. Really? Mm. Raised her eyebrows and answered the incoming call. It's you. An unfamiliar female voice squealed on the phone. Yes, it's Victoria. And who speaks? Lehman. There was a second pause at the other end of the line, after which the same thin voice said, offended. Jack, of course, he said that you have problems with your memory, but so much so. Victoria looked at her husband again with a question. Who is this? but he just winked at her and pointed to his watch. I'm in a hurry, he whispered with one lips. They hanged themselves there. After this, the husband went to work with a satisfied look, leaving Victoria in complete confusion. And she remembered that Soy should come home in half an hour, check on her and see if everything is okay. So who should she have fun with? Her mother-in-law or the one who was literally tearing her phone to pieces, like continued to attack Victoria endless questions. Listen, don't you seriously remember us? It is me, Anne, your best friend. U.S. Jackie said that you can't get close to you while you're being treated. During this time, we were all exhausted. And yesterday, he writes to us and tells us to drag you into the city. No, well, you always had a Mr. Spontaneity. Sorry, of course, for such frankness, mate. Anne, stop. I tried to pacify my interlocutor. Do you want to say that you and I were once friends before the accident? I mean... Are you my best friend? Confused by the appearance of another person in her life, whom she did not remember at all, she suggested Anne meet in the city center in the very cafe where they usually like to go with their husband. The woman wanted to talk to this girl and try to remember her. 
Still, this one Enzo insisted that they had known each other for many years. However, the meeting with my friend was not impressive that Victoria, to say the least, disappointed. Not only did she remember absolutely nothing of the things that this girl told her about, but Tan, she also turned out to be an extremely unpleasant girl in her own right. I couldn't believe that I trusted this nasty and envious girl with all my secrets. Yes, she would never share it with such a gossip. While they were sitting in the cafe, she managed to wash the bones of all their mutual friends. And although half of them Victoria I didn't even see her, she was offended that unlike this. Without hesitation, he throws mud at it. Man, so you're saying that you and I work together in the modeling business. I asked at some point Victoriato interrupt her endless dirty tirade and paused for a second as if her internal computer was having a hard time processing this simple question. Finally, an uncertain smile appeared on her face. Yes. And don't you remember our shows in Milan? How we discussed this famous model? She looks so beautiful in all the magazines, but in reality she is fat. I'm still amazed at what these agents saw in her. After all, the natural one was scary. Anne laughed unpleasantly, revealing her big white teeth. She continued thoughtfully, stirring the remains of her milkshake in a tall glass glass with a straw. Reese, who do I love more, dogs or cats? I asked again, what? Hmm. Flapping her long, thickly painted eyelashes, her friend stared at her. And what do cats have to do with it? Victoria looked at the girl carefully. But this is such a simple question. You say you've known me almost since school. Then you can't help but know which animals I love more. All best friends answer such questions with ease, especially when some of them have memory problems. What I definitely didn't expect was that then suddenly, out of the blue, he pulls out his mobile phone and starts hysterically writing something to someone in it. What are you doing? I asked her with a smile. She wouldn't be surprised if now she was posting some nasty stuff about her on the internet, but she didn't care at all. She just wanted to understand what was going on here. And she finished fiddling with her smartphone and with a changing grin, obviously intended to depict a smile so, you know, I was urgently called here for filming. I would be glad to chat with you more, but unlike you, I don't have a rich husband, so I have to work hard. Yes, and quickly jumped up from the table and sent Victoria a kiss. Don't be upset. We'll definitely chat again later, and then, you see, you'll feel better. Kyo, dear, in touch. With these words, the red-haired gossip fled from the cafe like a bright but stupid butterfly. I couldn't get rid of the thought that with this and there was something wrong. Well, it can't be that she chose such a mercantile person as her friend. Besides, she definitely didn't know the answer to her question. And all this fuss with the phone. Yes, she was just looking for an excuse to quickly leave and not continue to dive into slippery topics. But what could this mean? Victoria were at a loss. She had too many questions about her own past and she had not yet received an answer to any of them. Hearing her own phone vibrate in her purse, the woman immediately picked up the phone. Hello, honey. How are you? I asked Jack who called her from work. To be honest, not really. His wife admitted to him. I didn't like it at all. What kind of friend is this who has only clothes and gossip on her mind? Is it true? There was tension in the husband's voice. You don't have to communicate with her if you want. I just thought it would be useful for you to be with old acquaintances. You said it yourself. Yes, yes. I remember she hastened to reassure him. It's just that this meeting turned out to be not at all as sincere as I imagined. I'm going home now, Zoe, already there. I could cook us all something original for dinner tonight. They chatted a little more about household chores, after which she hung up and walked home. She wanted to take a little walk to be alone with her thoughts and just relax in silence. Weather that day was simply wonderful. Spring was in full swing. Apple trees were blooming everywhere. The flower beds were full of blooming flowers. A sea of floral herbal aromas floated in the air, and Victoria lingered for a couple of minutes in one of the courtyards near the playground. Looking at the little happy children playing in the sandbox, I felt a surge of incredible melancholy. What a pity that Kalia and I don't have our own baby. This is how I could now sit and watch our son or daughter. Maybe my soul would then feel much calmer. The young woman sat down on the bench watching the children with pleasure. Some of them were swinging happily on the swings while their mothers looked away with a proud look. Victoria. Here they say, look, envy how happy we are growing. Suddenly, Victoria, she felt her hands and feet suddenly become cold. Something seemed to switch in the young woman's head, and she clearly, as if in reality, saw herself in her arms with the small child. The newborn snored sweetly. His eyes were closed. He slept. 
At that moment, I was absolutely sure that I was holding my own son in my arms. However, her vision did not end there. The woman felt strong and gentle arms hug her shoulders, turned around to look at the child's father, and it was he, and to her great amazement, she saw in front of her not at all Jack. A tall, broad-shouldered, handsome man with deep, dark green eyes and golden hair did not fit with the image of her husband. Jack was a stocky brunette, slender but slightly taller than herself. This same stranger looked like he was a hero from an old fairy tale. She didn't know either the beautiful man or the child she was holding in her arms, but she was sure that both of them had the most direct relation to her. Really, Jack, is there still something she's not telling her? Is it possible that before him, Victoria, was there another family? But then where are they? What happened to them? Intrigued Victoria immediately hurried home. She eagerly awaited her husband's return so she could talk to him about her vision. Though seeing how worried she was, she herself became nervous, having seated her daughter-in-law in the kitchen. She tried to quickly ask her about what happened and how the meeting with her friend went. From Shun Sempatra is a cop that moment. I was by no means in the mood for a sincere conversation with my mother-in-law. Maybe I can help you with something. Looking in Victoria in the eyes, asked the businesswoman. I'm afraid that only Jack. Hmm. She sighed. I need to talk to him very seriously. A shadow ran across the woman's face, the nature of which was impossible to determine. The young woman referred to the fact that she needed rest, after which she went upstairs to her room. That evening, when Jack came back home, Victoria she immediately called him over and honestly told him about her sudden memory. After listening to his wife, the businessman was a little confused at first, but quickly pulled himself together. I was amazed at how quickly the reactions on his face changed. In a few moments, she managed to discern surprise, anger, confusion, and then an imperturbable calmness that hid all other feelings underneath. SG, darling, listen to me very carefully, the husband began, placing his wife on the bed. What you are talking about is impossible, but why? Mm. She looked at him incomprehensibly. Jack, I feel that these people are somehow connected to me very strongly. These emotions, this image, it was so real, so familiar. If there is something that I don't know about myself, you just have to tell me everything. Jackie covered his face with his hands, as if trying to isolate himself from his own feelings. The doctors warned me that such consequences were possible, he said slowly. You've been in a coma for too long, and part of your brain still remains not fully rest- well, What do you mean, Jack? I asked him again. What is wrong with me? The husband looked at her with sadness, even some guilt. Forgive me, I should have told you about everything earlier, Grace. What are you talking about? Can you explain? The husband carefully took Victoria B. the hands. No, hallucinations. The doctor said that this is how the consequences of a coma can manifest themselves. Victoria, she couldn't immediately comprehend what her husband was telling her. When it dawned on her, she shook her head negatively. No, Jack, no. The fact of the matter is that it was not a figment of my imagination. I'm sure I saw part of my past, but I can't understand when it was and who these people are to me. Jack looked at his wife with inexpressible regret. Many, it happens sometimes. Perhaps you experienced a powerful emotional shock when you looked at your children. So your mind tried to deceive you, to pass off wishful thinking as reality. No, no, she continued to persist. I normal. I know for sure that I have seen these people before. Jack, I didn't tell you about my dream. That nightmare. My husband guessed right away. Yes, she nodded. Victoria, it seems to me that I saw the same man and boy there. Only it seemed to be later than the memories on the playground. There's a face here, Jack. It immediately became dark. Victoria, let's not try to find an explanation for your nonsense, of course. I'm not very pleased that you see some strange man in your visions. But as for the child, or so, she jumped out of bed and threw out her hands nervously. Yes, I also wanted to ask why we still don't have children. You just said that the memory could have been triggered by children playing. What did you mean? Instead of answering, the husband slowly rose from the bed, after which he calmly walked to a small cabinet with medicines and took out a syringe with a sedative. Noticing this, she stepped back. No, Jack, I don't want a sedative. Explain to me how those kids and my visions are connected. Jack, what are you doing? The young woman's eyes filled with pure horror as her husband began to advance on her, holding a ready injection in his hand. His face was completely impenetrable. Nimi, everything is fine. Don't worry. You just need to calm down a little. Look at you. You're shaking all over. As Victoria, she retreated further and further until she finally felt something hard under her back. It was a wall. 
the young woman's heart filled with panic. She turned around, trying to find a way out. But at that moment, her husband suddenly grabbed her hands, making it impossible to resist. Jack, please don't, I don't want to. I'm scared. Jackie pulled his wife to him with force, and in one deft movement, stuck a syringe with a sedative into her neck. Don't be afraid, honey. Don't be afraid. Everything is fine. I will never let you go. Never. We will always be together. Before your eyes, Victoria, everything immediately floated away. The room was instantly filled with fog. When Jackie unclenched his embrace and carefully laid her on the bed, the woman looked at him with a completely blank look. Nanny, we don't have children because you're barren, the husband said unexpectedly affectionately. I didn't want to talk about it so as not to traumatize your already fragile psyche. However, now I see that we cannot do without it. I'll have to call you a psychotherapist tomorrow. He will prescribe you a new course of medications and you will definitely improve everything. She didn't know what kind of drug her husband was injecting her with, but she was sure that it was definitely not a sedative, more like tranquilizers. Suddenly it flashed through the woman's head, somewhere on the farthest border of her consciousness between sleep and reality. We also gave these to horses on our farm. Victoria, she didn't have time to grasp onto this thought because everything around her suddenly plunged into darkness. She woke up only the next morning. Jackie wasn't nearby, so I carefully slipped into the shower to wash away the remnants of sleep in a semi-conscious state caused by strange medications. Lord, didn't I really dream all this? I thought Victoria standing in front of powerful jets of hot water. Did I really remember something that Kalia didn't like, and that's why he did this to me? The woman shuddered with disgust. I remembered the terrible expression that flashed on my face, Jack, the moment he gave her the injection. God, he looked like he was crazy. I can't stay in this house next to him anymore. I need answers. Slipping out of the bathroom, Victoria, I got dressed and carefully went down to the first floor. The woman heard people quietly talking about something in the click story stood next to the high panoramic window and thoughtfully looked into the distance. There, where in the depths of her and her husband's large and flowering garden, there was a small beautiful lake in which huge rainbow carp slowly swam. Here, look how handsome they are, he said, hugging her, Jack. They were bought especially for you, so that you could come here at any time and watch our family in miniature. Jack smiled and pointed out to the young woman a pair of beautiful fish moving smoothly under the glass smooth water column. Look, the bigger ones like me, the husband continued. But this beauty with iridescent sides is you, Victoria, his female, his legal wife. You see how happy they are, just like you and me, Victoria. Then for a long time I looked at the majestic Pisces and thought that she too was now floating in the same way in the middle of the unknown of her own life. And just like these carps, it does not remember itself. Legend as with Diem slowly shifted her focus from her gaze to the reflection in the window. Tall, almost model height, slender like a tree trunk. Victoria, she had truly beautiful appearance. The platinum blonde who turned 25 last year looks like she stepped straight out of the pages of a fashion magazine. However, Jackie said that's how they met, like she was a model who was about to finally leave the business that was boring her, and he was a successful banker who managed several branches of one of the largest banks in the country. The husband told her that they met at some art exhibition, either dedicated to Impressionism or vice versa. It was something related to folk crafts. Jackie told her that he didn't remember exactly. I would like to remember at least something from all this. I thought to myself with bitterness. However, no matter how much the businessman's wife strained her memory, no matter how much she tried to reconstruct the events of that fateful day when she was in a terrible car accident and almost completely lost her memory, nothing I couldn't remember other than my name. Her first memory, after she finally came to her senses, was the long road home. The woman remembered the cozy interior of an expensive car in which her husband drove her to their luxurious country mansion located in one of the most closed and carefully guarded cottage communities. Next to her in the car sat a middle-aged woman dressed in a chic three-piece sky blue suit. Her hair was perfectly styled and her makeup could have been the envy of the Queen of England herself. The lady looked to be about 50, but she had a figure like that of Hollywood stars. Fit, slender with a minimum number of wrinkles on a beautiful but slightly cold face. It later turned out that it was the mother Jack Zoe. The banker's mother owned a large spa complex, so in matters of youth and beauty she really had no equal, at least in their city. 
After they arrived home, Jack was away told her in more detail about what happened to her. Honey, it's normal that you feel a little lost, her husband explained to her. The accident you and your driver got into was simply monstrous. The driver died on the spot and you. Jackie hesitated as if it was hard for him to talk about it and he did not know how to choose the right words so as not to shock his already confused wife. Finally, he said, they literally put you back together piece by piece. Your brain was severely damaged and after doctors performed several complex operations, you had to be put into an artificial Otherwise, you simply wouldn't have survived, my dear. Zoe, who was sitting right there, just silently lowered her eyes and put her palm to her forehead, as if she herself suddenly felt bad from the surge of worries for her daughter-in-law. You were in a coma for almost six months. She said quietly, my son visited you every day in the hope that your condition would finally improve enough to wake you up. However, at first, doctors did not give positive prognoses. They said that the chances of making it through were simply scanty, and you could, Victoria, you have conquered death. Well done. When Zoe Konstantinovna looked again at Victoria, there were tears in her eyes. She immediately approached her daughter-in-law and sincerely hugged her. Victoria, there was no choice but to respond to this gesture with a much less tight hug of his own. I've been waiting for you so much, Victoria said, meanwhile, Jack, and he also wiped tears from the corners of his eyes. You just can't imagine how long I've been waiting. Mom says it right. Even the doctors despaired. But I still believed, believed that you would come back to me. Honey, thank God that's what happened. Now you are home and I will never let you suffer again. The young woman looked at her husband and for a tiny moment, it suddenly seemed to her that she had already heard something like that. But it was under completely different circumstances and which ones, alas, she did not remember at all. She herself felt as if she had slept for several decades in a row, and when she woke up, she found herself in a completely different time and place than where she had once fallen asleep. The woman was haunted by a constant feeling of lethargy and physical weakness, and everything around her seemed somehow completely different from what it should have been. Thank you. Thanks to both of you, he answered slowly, Victoria, and the mother-in-law finally released her from her two strong hands. The young woman smiled faintly and added to her husband. I must be very lucky to have such a sensitive and caring family. I will try to remember you, you, and everything that happened before this terrible accident. I promise. Zoe, my son, and I quickly looked at each other. But the next second, a happy smile flashed on the face of the husband and mother-in-law. Of course, darling, the woman sang, taking her hand. We have no doubt about it. Jack will help you fill in all the gaps that have formed in your memory after the coma. To be honest, we have already prepared a little for this. So, once you are completely ready to start, just tell us, do you live with us? The mother-in-law was taken aback for a moment, as if she did not expect such tactlessness from her daughter-in-law. But then, realizing that this was just an ordinary question, Zoe softened. That's right, dear me, and you, and our Jack, we all live together in this wonderful house. I'll keep an eye on you if you don't mind, she said, looking carefully at her daughter-in-law. Jack, we are at work all day. In addition, he is often sent on business trips, including abroad. I think it will be better this way. Victoria turned a questioning glance from her to her husband, and he confirmed his mother's words. Darling, you have absolutely nothing to worry about. I'm taking some time off now, but I'll have to go back to the office in a couple of weeks. I want to be absolutely sure that nothing happens to you while I'm not home. Mom kindly agreed to help me with this, although her worries are beyond the roof. I'm sure you and Mom will have a great time together. Even before the accident, you were inseparable, real girlfriends. Jack laughed a low, pure laugh while looking at his mother as if he was looking for her support. She didn't keep herself waiting, and Zoe I laughed too. Of course, you and I will discuss so many things. We will prepare so many delicious things. You won't be bored with me, that's for sure. Mother-in-law patted softly Victoria on the hand, but it seemed to her that the woman did this too faintedly, as if talking about their friendship. The husband nevertheless embellished the true words somewhat so I in her attitude one way or another. But then she did not say anything, but only gave her loved ones another weak smile. She is really very tired. And the only thing she really, really wanted at that moment was just to get some sleep. Related Victoria did not resist the desert of Victoria and took her to the room designated for. Almost a year has passed since that moment, but the young woman has not advanced one iota in her numerous attempts to remember life before the moment of the accident. 
It's as if someone deliberately separated these two halves with an invisible line, and everything that came before was irretrievably lost. Her husband helped her as best he could, showing her a wedding album, which contained many photographs of both the celebration itself and afterwards from their everyday life. Here they are, happy and incredibly beautiful, posing for a photographer surrounded by two dozen friends, Victoria. She wore a gorgeous designer dress the color of baked milk, completely embroidered with silk and silver crystals that folded into a whimsical and slightly reminiscent of Scandinavian patterns. You are so beautiful here. Kissing his wife, he whispered Jack. I just gently dodged. She was not yet ready to get closer to her husband the way he would like. Too little time had passed and she had not yet had time to get used to him again or feel the feelings that had connected them, as he claimed, for three long years. I'm sorry, she said quietly, Victoria, but the husband did not seem to hear this. Continuing to try to establish closer communication with his wife, he tried to hug her, but the woman pulled away more insistently. No, Jack, please, I can't, but I love you. He answered her stupidly, slightly upset Jack, by his face. The woman realized that he had been waiting for this moment for a very long time, and now all he could do was look back at their wedding photos in disappointment. Okay, he said dryly, but did you remember anything? And you can't hide from me forever. After all, I'm your husband. You don't need to be afraid of me. Maybe if we started living together again, as before, you would quickly be able not only to remember, but also to feel for me the same love that I feel for you every day. You, Victoria, I felt bad at heart. She really wanted all those wonderful, sublime feelings he spoke about to return to her memory, Jack. But looking at the multicolored photographs, she felt absolutely nothing, anyone, even the slightest glimpse of memory by Victoria she was terribly ashamed. So she, that's what I thought, said the husband in a much colder tone. Sometimes it seems to me that you don't even try to remember anything. I understand this is hard for you, but you could just try to trust me in your mom, since your memory still doesn't want to come back to you. Look at your right hand. Victoria she obediently stared at her right hand, where her wedding ring with a huge pink diamond was on her ring finger. Jackie caught her glance and nodded curtly. You see, I gave you this ring on the day I proposed to you. You were happy to receive it. So happy that she immediately told me yes. Jack? Mm. She tried to justify herself, but her husband motioned for her to shut up. Please let me finish, he said, and a mournful expression instantly spread across his face. You don't remember now, but you and I have always been part of one whole. We loved each other so much that we even wrote special vows for each other for our wedding. Jackie looked for something in my wife's toilet cabinet and took out a large envelope. Inside was a sheet of coated paper neatly folded in half. On the sheet of paper was a love letter typed on a typewriter in which Victoria explained her feelings to her future husband. Here, read this carefully, her husband asked. If this doesn't bring back even a little memory of how happy we were, then I'm asking no, I'm begging you, just take my word for it. I love you, I love you more than anything in the world, and it will always be that way. With these words, the man left his wife's room, leaving her alone with the wedding vows and his far from rosy thoughts. Victoria, I read the message to my husband and cried. She cried because she couldn't remember either how she wrote it or what she felt. The oath was truly beautiful. So pure, so sincere. Lord, why? I don't remember any of this. I asked both myself and God the same question. Why can't I love my husband again and remember him? Her mother-in-law's advice didn't help either. Although they cooked together in the spacious kitchen and went out into the city together to visit the places that, as she assured her, Zoe loved most of all. It was all useless. Inside of Victoria it was as if there was a huge stone wall that did not allow her to look into the depths of her own memory and remember everything. Where in victory I, she was not left alone for a minute. Either her mother-in-law or herself was, my husband and I went to the city to unwind a couple of times a week. There they went shopping and to restaurants. Or Jack tried to spend time with his wife, visiting theaters, cinema, and exhibitions. She was very grateful to her husband for his work, but did not understand why she could not do everything the same, but on her own, without his presence. The woman wanted a little freedom, personal space. She hoped unsuccessfully that if she could be alone with her thoughts, then her memory might return to her much fa- No, honey, that's impossible. Mm, repeated to her over and over again, Jack. You are still too weak and cannot fully control yourself. What if you get some kind of dizziness? 
or, God forbid, will you completely lose consciousness and fall into a coma again? Bad darling, I won't survive this. You know, but I'll still have to go out in public alone sooner or later. You can't lock me in our house forever. Just thinking about it immediately made me shudder. She suddenly realized that, it turns out, she couldn't stand closed spaces and loneliness. Jack, but seeing his wife's reaction to his words, he instantly became nervous with irritation. Match in the corner of his eye even twitched. What's happened? Did you remember something? He asked somehow strangely. No, she answered. Why are you asking? Alice to Bend immediately relaxed noticeably and said more softly, I thought you felt something new. Maybe she remembered how you and I already argued in a similar way. Victoria shook her head negatively. Not really, but you're right. I realized that I couldn't be alone for too long. Then something seemed to push the woman from within and she looked carefully at her husband, Jack, and why during all this time none of my friends ever called me? Do I have no friends? The phone number you gave me, there is no one in the contact list except you and Zoe. What about my parents? Where are they, Jack? There were so many questions that Jack involuntarily began to walk around the room where they were talking. It was just one of those evenings when they were planning to go to the premiere of the Capitals play, which was touring their city. The man noticeably perked up and kept tugging at his cuffs in excitement pretending to adjust his emerald cufflinks. What is it, dear? I didn't understand, Victoria. Is there something you haven't told me yet? Jack, I will not leave here until I find out the whole truth. Jackie looked nervously at his wife, and in her soul there was an unpleasant feeling, a feeling that they were clearly hiding something from her. It's just that you've chosen the wrong time for this conversation, he finally said. Jack, we're going to the theater now, and you're here about your parents and friends. Let's talk later. I felt a sudden attack of anger and irritation. She stomped her foot hard on the carpet. But I want to know, have pity on me. I've been living in the dark for a year now and don't know who I am or what I am. I didn't ask because I thought it would be too hard for me and because I thought I would remember everything on my own. But nothing works. I don't know what to do next, how to get my memory back. Victoria, she felt herself begin to shake. She was clearly starting to get hysterical and my husband, fortunately, also understood this. Jack jumped up to Victoria and hugged her tightly, trying to warm her and calm her trembling. It was like a stretched ringing string. She couldn't control her own body. He stroked his wife. That's what I was talking about. It's too early for you to be alone. I was hoping you could remember bits and pieces of the main thing. Then sat her down on the bed and said in a soft but sad voice, Your parents, they died long ago. It was a hiking accident. Your mom and dad were mountain lovers and often kayaked in wild river areas. One day their boat couldn't withstand one of the rapids and capsized. She looked at her husband with red eyes from tears. Very natured. Did they drown? He nodded sadly and stroked Victoria on the cheek. The river was very cold and in those places the current was very strong. Their death was inevitable. I'm sorry, honey. I'm so sorry. Victoria burst into tears and buried her face in her husband's shoulder. Lord, what a nightmare. Oh, how long ago did this happen? Well, a long time ago, honey. You were only 20 then. You told me about it yourself. Jack gently stroked his wife's head and whispered soothing words into her ear. Then he said carefully, as for your friends, I bought you a new phone because your previous one was broken during an accident. There are no other contacts in it since I didn't want anyone to bother you again during your rehabilitation. Victoria, she calmed down a little and, wiping her tears, exactly but I didn't even think about it. I'm sorry, Jack. I am very ashamed that I could think badly of you. I really decided that you wanted to hide something from me. The husband just smiled affectionately and suggested, if you want to meet your friends, then so be it. I'll tell them your new number, but just be sure to stay in touch. When I walk, I need to know that you're okay, you know, nodded. This news made her feel a little lighter. Well, that's nice, the husband said contentedly. You know, I changed my mind about going to the theater today. I think we've had enough emotions for this evening. Let me give you the sedative the doctor prescribed, and then we'll go to bed early. Is that okay? I thought about it and agreed. She really is very emotional about you. The husband assured her that he was not at all offended by his wife's suspicion, like he understands everything. Still, living without a past is such stress. Having given my wife an injection, Jack breathed out a sigh of relief when she fell into a blissful sleep within a few minutes. 
That evening, he realized for the first time that he was with Victoria, there is still a long way to go before she finally comes to terms with the fact that her true place is in this house and in his, and only his, heart. That same night, Victoria saw a very strange dream, which later I could not get out of my head. In that dream, she couldn't understand where exactly she was, since everything around her was engulfed in bright orange flashes, and the woman herself could not breathe, normally because of the smoke that had entered her lungs. Better and acrid, this smoke enveloped all the objects that the businessman's wife tried to reach in a fruitless attempt to save them from the approaching flame. I felt the ever-increasing heat on my skin, but did not see a way out of the smoky space. Then, as if out of nowhere, two blurry figures appeared in front of her. I couldn't see exactly what they looked like, but I felt that one of them, the taller one, was a man, and the second, very small, clearly belonged to a child. Victoria, I heard a strong male voice ahead of where are you, Victoria? The voice repeated her name over and over again. She didn't try to quickly shout, I'm here, but not a single sound escaped her throat. In desperation, the woman grabbed her own neck and suddenly heard a piercing childish voice, Mom, Mommy, and she began to rush around in the blinding fiery fog, trying to reach or at least get closer to those ghostly figures that were calling her. She understood in her soul that she definitely needed to give them a sign that she was here that she was alive and that everything was fine with her. However, the blurry silhouettes moved further away the closer I tried to get to them, Victoria. Finally, experiencing a surge of inhuman despair, the woman screamed into the void, watching the figures move away and dissolve in the smoke. Wait, wait, please don't leave me here. No, I want to come to you. Wake up, called her Jack, and at that moment the woman opened her huge blue eyes. It turned out that she was still lying in her bed and her husband was sitting next to her, bending over her and forcefully shaking her shoulders so that she would wake up. Anxiety and sadness were clearly visible on the husband's face. What's wrong with you? What did you see? Wife, not yet fully awakened from what she had seen, just shook her head and pulled her husband's hands away from her face. Everything is fine, Jack. Nothing. I just had a nightmare. The young woman regained her breath with difficulty and looked tenderly at her husband. No. Don't worry, give me a couple of minutes, my teachers. Victoria Ash turned on her other side, trying to cope with the feelings that rushed over her. What she saw in the dream was so vivid and realistic that the woman could not move away from the thought that it could very well be a memory. Just what? And why didn't she see in this strange dream, Jack? As if he had nothing to do with it at all. Are you sure you don't need sedatives? I could get you some pills if you want. Looked at her husband with outright surprise. Are you serious, honey? Do you want to turn me into a vegetable? Actonsed for a moment, but laughed lightly and threw a pillow at him. Yes, I was just joking, fool. Of course, I don't mean anything like that. Well, really, it's just a bad dream. There is no need to take pills every time I feel emotions. Jackie smiled, but somehow not joyfully, as if he felt guilty about something. However, quickly pretending that nothing had happened, he invited his beloved wife to drink coffee together. I um, even baked cheesecakes for us today before rushing off to work. As long as I have lived, I am always amazed at her amazing ability to combine the talents of a housewife and a businesswoman. God, how embarrassing. Hmm. Pressing her hands to her face, she said, Victoria, it was I who had to get up early and prepare everything. Instead, you also have to strain your mother in the kitchen. Jackie just waved his hand, after which he tenderly kissed his wife on the cheek. You just don't know her as I do. In fact, all this amateur activity with pots has always been a joy for her. Before my father died, she was an ordinary housewife for a long time, raised me, looked after my dad when he came home from work, and then, when her father died of a heart attack, she took the business seriously. Dad left us some inheritance. She used this money to open her first beauty salon. Victoria looked at her husband with sincere interest. This was the first time he had told her so openly about his family. I was still just a boy then, about 17 years old. At first, I couldn't accept this new form of my mother. And then she clearly explained to me that in this life you need to fight for yours to the end, gnawing it with your teeth, but not giving it to anyone. So I first entered college at the Faculty of Economics, and then got a job in a bank. But gradually I became one of the people and met you. Jack hugged with tenderness Victoria, and she allowed herself to be kissed for real. At some point, the woman thought that the dream she had was really just a meaningless nightmare. A couple of hours later, when the husband was already getting ready for work, the phone of Victoria suddenly burst out an insistent third. 
Looking at the screen, the woman was surprised to find that they were calling her from an unknown number. Pick up the phone, he advised her. Jack throwing his jacket over his shoulders. I'm sure you're happy about who's calling you. Really? Raised her eyebrows and answered the incoming call. Yeah, it's you. An unfamiliar female voice squealed on the phone. Yes, at Victoria. And who speaks? Lance said there was a second pause at the other end of the line, after which the same thin voice said offendedly. Jack, of course, he said that you have problems with your memory, but so much so. Victoria looked at her husband again with the question, who is this? But he just winked at her and pointed to his watch. For I'm in a hurry, he whispered with one lips. They hanged themselves there. After this, the husband went to work with a satisfied look, leaving Victoria in complete confusion. And she remembered that Zoe should come home in half an hour, check on her and see if everything is okay. So who should she have fun with, her mother-in-law or the one who's literally tearing her phone to pieces? The caller continued to attack Victoria endless questions. Listen, don't you seriously remember us? It is me, Yenon, your best friend. You as Jackie said that you can't get close to you while you're being treated. During this time, we were all exhausted. And yesterday, he writes to us and tells us to drag you into the city. No, well, you always had a spontaneity. Sorry, of course, for such frankness. I can't stop. Mm. I tried to pacify my interlocutor. Do you want to say that you and I were once friends before the accident? I mean, are you my best friend? Confused by the appearance of another person in her life, whom she did not remember at all. She suggested a mate in the city center, in the very cafe where they usually like to go with her husband. The woman wanted to talk to this girl and try to remember her. Still, this one and O insisted that they had known each other for many years. However, the meeting with my friend was not impressive Victoria, to say the least, disappointed. Not only did she remember absolutely nothing of the things that this girl told her about, but Anne, she also turned out to be an extremely unpleasant girl in her own right. I couldn't believe that I trusted this nasty and envious girl with all my secrets. Yeah, she would never share it with such a gossip. While they were sitting in the cafe, she managed to wash the bones of all of their mutual friends. And although half of them, Victoria, I didn't even see her, she was offended that and like this, without hesitation, he throws mud at everyone. And so you're saying that you and I work together in the modeling business? Hmm, I asked at some point, Victoriato interrupt her endless dirty tirade and paused for a second as if her internal computer was having a hard time processing this simple question. Finally, an uncertain smile appeared on her face. Yes, and don't you remember our shows in Milan? How we discussed this famous model. She looks so beautiful in all the magazines, but in reality, she is fat. I'm still amazed at what these agents saw in her. After all, the natural one was scary. Anne laughed unpleasantly, revealing her big white teeth. She continued thoughtfully, stirring the remains of her milkshake in a tall glass glass with a straw. Who do I love more, dogs or cats? I asked again. What? Flapping her long, thickly painted eyelashes, her friend stared at her. And what do cats have to do with it? Victoria looked at the girl carefully. But this is such a simple question. You say you've known me almost since school. Then you can't help but know which animals I love more. All best friends answer such questions with ease, especially when some of them have memory problems. What I definitely didn't expect was that, and suddenly, out of the blue, he pulls out his mobile phone and starts hysterically writing something to someone in it. Mm, what are you doing? I asked her with a smile. She wouldn't be surprised if then she was posting some nasty stuff about her on the internet, but she didn't care at all. She just wanted to understand what was going on here and she finished fiddling with her smartphone and with a changing grin, obviously intended to depict a smile, said, You know, I was urgently called here for filming. I would be glad to chat with you more, but unlike you, I don't have a rich husband, so I have to work hard. Yes. Anne quickly jumped up from the table and sent Victoria a kiss. Don't be upset. We'll definitely chat again later. And then, you see, you'll feel better. Tayo, dear, in touch. With these words, the red-haired gossip fled from the cafe like a bright but stupid butterfly. I couldn't get rid of the thought that with this and there was something wrong. Well, it can't be that she chose such a mercantile person as her friend. Besides, she definitely didn't know the answer to her question. And all this fuss with the phone. Yes, she was just looking for an excuse to quickly leave and not continue to dive into slippery topics. But what could this mean, Victoria? We're at a loss. She had too many questions about her own past 
and she had not yet received an answer to any of them. Hearing her own phone vibrate in her purse, the woman immediately picked up the phone. Hello, honey. How are you? I asked Jack who called her from work. To be honest, not really. His wife admitted to him. I didn't like it at all. What kind of friend is this, who has only clothes and gossip on her mind? Is it true? There was tension in the husband's voice. You don't have to communicate with her if you want. I just thought it would be useful for you to, to be with old acquaintances. You said it yourself. Yes, yes. I remember she hastened to reassure him. It's just that this meeting turned out to be not at all as sincere as I imagined. I'm going home, no Zoe already there. I could cook us all something original for dinner tonight. They chatted a little more about household chores, after which she hung up and walked home. She wanted to take a little walk to be alone with her thoughts and just relax in silence. Weather that day was simply wonderful. Spring was in full swing. Apple trees were blooming everywhere. The flower beds were full of blooming flowers. A sea of floral herbal aromas floated in the air, and Victoria lingered for a couple of minutes in one of the courtyards near the playground looking at the little happy children playing in the sandbox. I felt a surge of incredible melancholy. What a pity that Coley and I don't have our own baby. This is how I could now sit and watch our son or daughter. Maybe my soul would then feel much calmer. The young woman sat down on the bench watching the children with pleasure. Some of them were swinging happily on the swings while their mothers looked away with a proud look, Victoria. Here, they say, look, envy how happy we are growing. Suddenly, Victoria, she felt her hands and feet suddenly become cold. Something seemed to switch in the young woman's head, and she clearly, as if in reality, saw herself in her arms with a small child, lines that the newborn snored sweetly. His eyes were closed. He slept. At that moment, I was absolutely sure that I was holding my own son in my arms. However, her vision did not end there. The woman felt strong and gentle arms hug her shoulders turned around to look at the child's father and it was he and to her great amazement. She saw in front of her not at all Jack. A tall, broad-shouldered, handsome man with deep dark green eyes and golden hair did not fit with the image of her husband. Jack was a stocky brunette, slender, but slightly taller than herself. This same stranger looked like he was a hero from an old fairy tale. She didn't know either the beautiful man or the child she was holding in her arms but she was sure that both of them had the most direct relation to her. But Jackie's, there's still something she's not telling her. Is it possible that before him, Victoria was there another? But then where are they? What happened to them? Intrigued, Victoria immediately hurried home. She eagerly awaited her husband's return so she could talk to him about her vision. Zoe, seeing how worried she was, she herself became nervous. Having seated her daughter-in-law in the kitchen, she tried to quickly ask her about what happened and how the meeting with her friend went. However, Toria, at that moment, I was by no means in the mood for a sincere conversation with my mother-in-law. Maybe I can help you with something. Looking in Victoria in the eyes, asked the businesswoman. Here, I'm afraid that only Jack, you. She sighed. I need to talk to him very seriously. The shadow ran across the woman's face, the nature of which was impossible to determine. The young woman referred to the fact that she needed rest, after which she went upstairs to her room. That evening, when Jack came back home, Victoria she immediately called him over and honestly told him about her sudden memory. After listening to his wife, the businessman was a little confused at first, but quickly pulled himself together. I was amazed at how quickly the reactions on his face changed. In a few moments, she managed to discern surprise, anger, confusion, and then an imperturbable calmness that hid all other feelings underneath M-I-D-S-E-N-G. Darling, listen to me very carefully, the husband began placing his wife on the bed. What you are talking about is impossible, but why? She looked at him incomprehensibly. Jack, I feel that these people are somehow connected to me very strongly, these emotions, this image. It was so real, so familiar. If there is something that I don't know about myself, you just have to tell me everything. Jack, he covered his face with his hands, as if trying to isolate himself from his own feelings. The doctors warned me that such consequences were possible, he said slowly. You've been in a coma for too long, and part of your brain still remains not fully restored. Now, what do you mean, Jack? I asked him again. What is wrong with me? The husband looked at her with sadness, even some guilt. Forgive me, I should have told you about everything earlier. Now, what are you talking about? Can you explain? The husband carefully took Victoria by the hands. No, hallucinations. 
The doctor said that this is how the consequences of a coma can manifest themselves. Victoria, she couldn't immediately comprehend what her husband was telling her. When it dawned on her, she shook her head negatively. No, Jack, no. The fact of the matter is that it was not a figment of my imagination. I'm sure I saw part of my past, but I cannot understand when it was and who these people are to me. Jack looked at his wife with inexpressible regret. Mahani, it happens sometimes. Perhaps you experienced a powerful emotional shock when you looked at your children. So your mind tried to deceive you, to pass off wishful thinking as reality. No, no, she continued to persist. I normal. I know for sure that I've seen these people before. Jack, I didn't tell you about my dreams, that nightmare. My husband guessed right away. Yeah, she nodded. Victoria, it seems to me that I saw the same man and boy there. Only it seemed to be later than the memories on the playground. There's a face here, a jacket immediately became dark. Ling Victoria, let's not try to find an explanation for your nonsense. Of course, I'm not very pleased that you see some strange man in your visions. But as for the child, she jumped out of bed and threw out her hands nervously. Yes, I also wanted to ask why we still don't have children. You just said that the memory could have been triggered by children playing. What did you mean? Instead of answering, the husband slowly rose from the bed, after which he calmly walked to a small cabinet with medicines and took out a syringe with a sedative. Noticing this, she stepped back. No, Jack, I don't want a sedative. Explain to me how those kids and my visions are connected. Jack, what are you doing? The young woman's eyes filled with pure horror as her husband began to advance on her, holding a ready injection in his hand. His face was completely impenetrable. Honey, everything is fine, don't worry. You just need to calm down a little. Look at you, you're shaking all over. Latoria, she retreated further and further until she finally felt something hard under her back. It was a wall. The young woman's heart filled with panic. She turned around trying to find a way out. But at that moment, her husband suddenly grabbed her hands, making it impossible to resist. Jack, please don't, I don't want to. I'm scared. Jackie pulled his wife to him with force and in one deaf movement stuck a syringe with a sedative into her neck. Don't be afraid, honey. Don't be afraid. Everything is fine. I will never let you go. Never. We will always be together. Before your eyes, Victoria. Everything immediately floated away. The room was instantly filled with fog. When Jackie unclenched his embrace and carefully laid her on the bed, the woman looked at him with a completely blank look. Honey, we don't have children because you're barren. The husband said unexpectedly, affectionately. I didn't want to talk about it so as not to traumatize your already fragile psyche. However, now I see that we cannot do without it. I'll have to call you a psychotherapist tomorrow. He will prescribe you a new course of medications and you will definitely improve everything. She didn't know what kind of drug her husband was injecting her with, but she was sure that it was definitely not a sedative. More like tranquilizers. Suddenly, it flashed through the woman's head somewhere on the farthest border of consciousness between sleep and reality. We also gave these to horses on our farm. Victoria, she didn't have time to grasp onto this thought because everything around her suddenly plunged into darkness. She woke up only the next morning. Jackie wasn't near, so I carefully slipped into the shower to wash away the remnants of sleep in a semi-conscious state caused by strange medications. Lord, didn't I really dream all this? I thought Victoria standing in front of powerful jets of hot water did I really remember something that Kalia didn't like? And that's why he did this to me. The woman shuddered with disgust. I remember the terrible expression that flashed on my face, Jack, the moment he gave her the injection. God, he looked like he was crazy. I can't stay in this house next to him anymore. I need answers. Slipping out of the bathroom, Victoria, I got dressed and carefully went down to the first floor. The woman heard people quietly talking about something in the 